the order. It is the opinion of the chair and staff that items on today's agenda constitute a central business of this body and that meeting electronically is necessary to protect the health, safety, welfare of Tennesseans in light of the COVID-19 outbreak. Are there any objections? Hearing none, I would like to thank the Metro ITS department for assisting us today. Uh, in addition to uh, our legal counsel, um, Margaret Darby, who has, has really done yeoman's work over the last few months uh, for this board and all the staff of Metro and our outside counsel as well, Mr. Chu. It is, this meeting is being live streamed on Nashville.gov. So for those of you who want to tune in that way, that is available to you as well. I will now call the roll. Please unmute when I call your name and indicate your presence by saying I. Also note for each action item, we will take votes by a roll call as well because we're doing this virtually. So with that, I will now take the roll. Nigel Hodge. Aye. Tim Weaver. Present. Christina Allen. Present. Quinn Siegel. Aye. Tequila Johnson. Aye. Sarah Hanna. Aye. Winnie Forrester. I'm, I'm present. Thank you. And Anthony Davis. Aye. And myself, Peter Hauser, I'm here. So our first item on our agenda is approval of the minutes uh, from our February 26th meeting. You received um, the minutes via email and I'll just uh, let you all have a minute to review them, see if there are any questions, comments, and then I'll take a motion. Hey, Chair Hauser, while, while people are reviewing the minutes, I just want to very quickly thank we had several board members who were out at, during that February meeting, and um, we had some people that, that hopped on to make ensure we had a quorum to be able to conduct business, and we also had some technical challenges. So I just want to thank those board members that were able to hop on in February and certainly thank the Metro team as well as we worked through some uh, IT issues at the last meeting. So thank you to everybody. Thank you, Nigel. So are there any questions, comments, or changes to the February minutes? Was, is there a question on here about whether Paul Baggett was there? Is that why this is highlighted? This is Margaret. The reason it was highlighted is because we were unclear who Paul Baggett represented, what firm he was from. Sorry, the highlight should have been removed before. No, that's fine. I just want to make sure we didn't need to try to figure out what anything about him to finalize the minutes. Oftentimes you'll see on there that the uh, that the attendees at the meeting, we also note uh, what firm they represent, if that's available. With that, I'd like to accept the minutes, um, move to accept the minutes. Do I have a second? I'll second, Chair Hauser. Okay, so that was Christina Allen and Nigel. Hodge, we have a motion before us and a second. Any discussion on the motion? If not, we will do a roll call vote to accept the minutes. Nigel Hodge. Accept. Ken Weaver. Aye. Christina Allen. Accept. Quinn Siegel. Aye. Tequila Johnson. Aye. Sarah Hanna. Aye. Winnie Forrester. Anthony Davis. Aye. And Ginger Hauser, aye. So you approve the meeting minutes from February. At this time, I'm going to take a point of personal privilege uh, to 
to allow a couple of our special guests to uh, make some opening comments. I believe we have uh, Mayor John Cooper and Commissioner Rolf um, with the State Economic and Community Development. And Mayor Cooper, if you are here, I will recognize you first to make your three comments. Um, well, I hope you can hear me. And I just want to thank you, Chair, and all the members of the board for having me uh, here today. Um, it's an important day for Nashville, and I'm glad you're here to help make that possible. And I know Commissioner Rolf is also with us, and I, I want to thank him for the great partnership that has made today's proposal possible. That's a lot of work by a lot of parties, including the, our partners at the state of Tennessee. The proposal you're going to hear about today is a game changer for Nashville in employment, education, economic opportunity, and affordable housing. And as you consider this proposal, I just I want to highlight a few elements, and let's start with the technical aspects. This project is just, it's not the kind of TIF project that Metro has used in the past. It does not involve infrastructure funding using new property taxes generated through redevelopment. I mean, it, 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 it involves that, but it, we are not issuing bonds or borrowing money or incurring interest costs. Oracle is going to use $175 million of its own money, and they're going to build roads, sidewalks, a pedestrian bridge, park space, as well as greenways, recreational areas, flood control measures, and other public infrastructure, all of which is going to be transferred over to Metro ownership. They are building our infrastructure. And the development property also includes a brownfield site and a former landfill. And the remediation costs of that brownfield are estimated to be a minimum of $30 million and could be $100 million. All of this will be Oracle's responsibility. Now, the first phase of the development is scheduled to be completed within five years. And that's when the property is expected to generate approximately $18 million in property taxes. That is up from $750,000 today. And for 25 years or until Oracle has recovered its investment without interest, Metro and Oracle will each receive half of these new additional property taxes generated on the site. And Oracle, simply put, will be paying for the infrastructure ultimately used and owned by the public. The project is expected to generate thousands of jobs during the construction period, and Oracle has committed to establishing a goal for spending a minimum of 20% of its project costs among small, minority, and women-owned businesses. And what's more, the infrastructure covered by the project agreement will allow for potential additional further property investments by Oracle and others. Now, those are the technical components of the proposal, the what. But the proposal before you today is also about the why, why this opportunity matters for national families. Imagine Nashville's great neighborhood, next great neighborhood on the East Bank. And we have the opportunity to reconnect people to the Cumberland River, to build a bridge that connects East Nashville to Germantown, to revitalize our Jefferson Street corridor towards Nashville's legacy HBCU institutions, Meharry Fisk and TSU. And this project will generate an estimated $9 million a year in additional property taxes for Metro. And I am fully committed to prioritizing those revenues for affordable housing. Councilwoman Suara has a plan to legislatively declare Metro's intent to prioritize those revenues for affordable housing, and I fully support the Councilwoman's proposal. We have an opportunity to create 8,500 jobs here, not just jobs, but STEM careers, the type of careers that can change families. And Oracle will use Metro's workforce development program to ensure that they make reasonable efforts to hire Davidson County residents. But really, this is a great partnership opportunity for our schools. Oracle shares Metro's commitment to long-term collaboration with Nashville's HBCUs. They are already ranked as a top supporter of HBCUs nationwide. They want to bring their Oracle Academy to Metro schools and inspire and pr help prepare young people from K through 12 for careers as engineers and data scientists. 
And Oracle shares our values in other respects. They're among the few corporate citizens to receive a score of 100% in the Human Rights Campaign Corporate Equality Index. Now, these are the priorities that are on my mind when I worked on the proposal that is now before you for full public consideration, and I appreciate your deliberation and review. I'm happy to answer any questions questions that you have, but I completely believe that this agreement is going to create a bright future for thousands and thousands of Nashvillians, and I hope you put it before the Metro Council for its consideration and approval. Thank you very much, Chair. I'm honored um, to be here and part of your program today. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I appreciate your comments. Commissioner Rawls. I understand yes, you are yes. with us, and I would be delighted for you to address the board as well. Great. Thank you, uh, Chair Hauser. Um, as the, Madam Chair said, my name is Bobby Roth, and our role here at the state of Tennessee, we are responsible for recruiting great global brands and small and medium-sized companies to our state. And as you will quickly learn, this has been a two-year endeavor that has uh, allowed us to aggressively recruit this global brand to our state, specifically to Nashville. Mayor Cooper and Governor Lee have both been directly involved in a whole host of conversations to recruit Oracle. And while this has been a two-year process, we now are at that, I think, very significant point in time where we are asking our city, our industrial development board, uh, to hopefully approve what we think has been very well thought out. You just heard uh, Mayor Cooper talk about the benefits. At the end of the Oracle presentation, I'll spend, Madam Chair, if allowed, another three minutes just talking about our state's perspective. And so with that, I will um, yield the floor back to you and thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Commissioner. So we are about to hold a public hearing on the River North infrastructure or the Oracle uh, Economic Impact Plan. Because we're virtual, let just, uh, I would say, be a little patient. If we have some technical difficulties, um, we, we've got phones and video, and it's a little bit challenging, but we want to hear your opinion. Um, the number that you will call is going to be 629-255-1989. I will repeat that just in case you need to write it down. 629 each caller will have three minutes of speaking time, and I will attempt to be the best of my ability to let you know kindly when your three minutes are up. I will now open the public hearing, and Charday, um, you can give us our first caller. Yes, Chair, we do have callers in the queue. We're working to get you the first caller now. Okay. I will also say why Sharday is working on the, the technical pieces of this. Um, this may be a little bit of a long meeting. You all are all adults. If you need to mute yourself and turn your video off and um, take a bio break, get a cup of coffee, um, we, will, we will keep going and you, you take care of you while we're doing business for the city. Chair, the first caller. Thank you, Sharnay. First caller, I will just ask you to introduce yourself so that we know who is on the line, and then you will have three minutes. Good morning. Uh, my name is Alexander Curtis. I live at 3818 Abbott Martin Road, Nashville, Tennessee, 37215. And this morning, I represent the Greater Nashville Technology Council. The NTC is a membership-based trade association representing the Greater Nashville's $8 billion tech sector. Our 570 member companies represent a variety of industry verticals that include two-person startups to multinational corporations. 
Adding Oracle to our expanding list of tech employers will provide more opportunities for everyone in our community and will enhance our reputation as a tech hub. At the heart of Nashville's success is a, a regional creative culture that fosters an ideal environment for growth and innovation. The Greater Nashville area is a welcoming and cooperative ecosystem that actively nurtures both new and existing tech businesses. Nashville's national profile is a desirable destination for technology dependent companies looking to expand or relocate from other parts of the globe and it continues to grow. Evidence of this can be seen over the 36% growth of our tech workforce over the past five years. We become a magnet for new tech talent from other markets and are aggressively expanding our own tech talent pipeline, resulting in one of the fastest growing tech workforces in North America. The tech jobs do represent game changers as they pay almost twice what the median job pays in Middle Tennessee. And the learning curve for skills necessary to get a tech job is relatively short. Opportunities like the recent Amazon announcements and the pending Oracle deal are rare. They're critically important to Nashville's future. These organizations are all making investments in our city and our citizens. If Oracle's history is an indicator of what we should expect, should it decide to plant roots in our city, investments in infrastructure, support for our diverse community, and advancing education for all. Nashville has never been better prepared for an opportunity such as this. We have a robust tech talent pipeline that's been expanding every year from our public and private school systems, 20 plus colleges and universities, a growing number of tech boot camps and apprenticeships, and a broad range of nonprofits focused on helping recent graduates and adult job changers succeed in the transition to tech. Again, adding Oracle to our expanding list of employers will only provide more opportunities for everyone in our community and will enhance our reputation as a tech hub. The future for technology in Nashville is a bright one and we look forward to welcoming Oracle in our community. Thank you. Thank you. Sharday, next, next call. Next caller, introduce yourself and you have three minutes. One second here, we're putting the caller through now. Okay. Here you have the next caller. Thank you, good morning. Introduce yourself and you have three minutes. Yes, hi, my name is Blake Docker. I live at 623 Philwood Drive, Nashville, 7214. Um, I am um, a bit torn on the proposal for the Oracle development. Um, I think on the one hand, it sounds like a great opportunity for the city in terms of um, some tax revenue as well as job opportunity, but I'm a bit um, skeptical of the lack of public comment on the matter. Um, it seems, I know we have this forum and this opportunity, but I would ask for um, a delay um, on the vote uh, to pass this until there's a more thorough um, public uh, comment period so that we can really hear from residents who live in uh, this neighborhood or near the site, or even those who, um, you know, who are interested to give feedback um, to this proposal. Um, it is ultimately not a company's job to define what we need as a city in terms of our infrastructure. Um, and although they're willing to pay for it, um, ultimately it is our city as citizens. So I, I would ask that the board would delay the vote until we could hear more from um, the public. It's a point we're having this public hearing at 10 a.m. on a Tuesday. So how many folks um, would actually be able to attend this? Um, so I just ask for more a more thorough public process, particularly because um, of the tax incentives given to the company that could be used to potentially invest, um, yes, in public housing, but also in education, education, um, any dollars that we leave off, the, um, you know, leave off the table here are dollars that don't get reinvested into our community. So I would ask for a delay in the vote so that we could have a more thorough public process. 
Thank you, Robert. Thank you. In Charday, we're ready for the next caller. Here you have the next caller. Thank you very much. Um, welcome. Introduce yourself, and you have three minutes, caller. Yes, my name is Jill Aikens, and I live um, on Enchanted Circle here in Nashville, Tennessee. I have a lot of concerns about this. Um, first of all, Oracle is a billion-dollar company. They're a large corporation. And I don't feel like we should be giving any tax breaks at all to move their hub to Nashville. My property taxes have gone up, and I don't feel like a billion-dollar company needs any tax incentives to move to an area. And if they do, there's something wrong with that. Secondly, uh, the mayor and his people keep touting that, you know, they're bringing over 8,000 jobs to Nashville. I want to know specifically who's getting those jobs. Um, it's mentioned in an article that those jobs are six-figure jobs. Are those jobs going to be for match billions? Are those jobs going to be people that they're bringing from, you know, their other um, locations to fill those jobs? Um, I think that's a big consideration because um, Nashville is a place that's really overcrowded now, and we don't have enough infrastructure for all these people that are moving in already. And Oracle is bringing more people in. And just because they start with 8,000 doesn't mean it's going to end up, you know, it's not going to end up being more than that. Um, the, the next thing I'm interested in is they're, they're touting that they're going to put some sort of Oracle Academy in Metro schools. Which Metro schools are they putting it in? Um, and the other thing is the affordable housing. What do they mean by affordable? I want to know numbers. You know, the average person in Nashville right now, it's, it's hard for them to even afford to buy a home. And so I want to know if, if affordable affordable housing is different than low-income housing. And I want to know, uh, is the housing going to be built for people in Nashville that need housing? Or is it going to be built for people that they're, you know, only their workers, basically, that they're talking about? I just don't like the fact that there hasn't been, like, openness about this entire thing. And just because, they're, you know, they want to live, they want to bring their hub to Nashville doesn't mean that we need to accept it. And I really do um, support the Equity Alliance for, you know, letting us talk about this and letting us get out, you know, what we as citizens of Nashville who pay taxes feel about this move. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate your call and your comments. Charde, we are ready for the next call. Here you have the next caller. Thank you very much. Welcome to the public hearing. Um, please state your name and you have three minutes. Hi, my name is Amber. I'm at 1703 Villa Place, 37212. And i going to repeat some of the same um, information or requests that the previous callers have made to delay the vote. Um, I'm really concerned that there hasn't been a lot of information heard from the residents who are actually going to be affected by the site. We, um, even though Oracle has said that they're going to be um, doing lots of things in Nashville, I want to actually know the amount of money they plan on investing, where their kids are going to be going to school, who's going to be getting the job and how are they going to make Nashville better uh, for everyone and not just continue um, moving people in from other cities that have prestigious jobs and are paying homes that are incredibly expensive and um, you know unaffordable. Thank you. 
Thank you. So our day we are ready for the next call. Here you have the next caller. Thank you very much. State your name and you have three minutes. Okay, uh, my name is Chris Carrington. My address is 108 Abbeywood Drive, uh, 37215. And I just wanted to call to voice my support for the River North uh, plan. You, you know, I've been reading so much about this and it's very, very exciting. And, and these other companies, you know, that we've recruited in the past into the area, such as Nissan, Mitsubishi, Alliance Bernstein, Amazon, you know, they have been great, wonderful, but this development is on another order of magnitude and it truly has the potential to be transformative for the city. Uh, you know, in addition to the opportunities that I think it affords, uh, you know, area residents for jobs directly with Oracle, it's the spinoff effects that are equally exciting. Um, especially in, the, in in that river north area along Dickerson Pike. You know, I, I've been through there um, some over the years, and, and to see where it has come in the last decade has, has been amazing. But to think about what it could become it, it, with this development is, is really, really exciting. So, again, I just want to call and say that I fully support uh, this development and uh, hope that we can get everything done to make it happen. Thank you for your time and your input. Sardé, we're ready for the next caller. Here you have the next caller. Welcome, please introduce yourself and you have to do Good morning, thank you. I am Andrea Arnold with the National Convention of Visitor Corporation. We're located at 150 4th Avenue North, Maxwell 37219. I wanna thank you very much for allowing me a minute to comment this morning. The National Convention of Visitors Corps proudly supports the River North Infrastructure Plan. We feel it critically benefits the hospitality industry here in the city. It expands our downtown core, adding to the offerings and the vibrancy of our destination appeal as we market the city to convention groups, who, I mean, excuse me, business travelers and leisure visitors globally. We're excited, obviously, for the potential of future development along the east side of the riverfront to expand even more offerings and energize that side of town, um, especially for visitors um, looking at that side of the, of the city to enjoy connect well with the stadium and East Nashville areas that are well sought after by visitors. And having Oracle there, a leading company in the tech sector, as a Nashville-based company will bring critical exposure and credibility to recruiting other new meetings and conventions in the tech market. Every major destination in the country will be competing aggressively for visitors and meetings and conventions coming out of the pandemic. Nashville has worked tremendously hard to build itself as a premier global destination over the last two decades. The hospitality industry, the second largest industry in the city and in the state, is a vital source of jobs and local tax generation. It is very important that we continue to support and invest in projects like this that expand our reputation and offerings as Nashville's hospitality industry rebuilds after the pandemic. Thank you again very much for your time this morning. Thank you for coming again. Sharday, next caller. Welcome. Please introduce yourself and you have three minutes. Hello, uh, my name is Julie Gamble. I live at 1440 Pennock Avenue, uh, 37207. So I actually live about a mile away from the proposed uh, development site. Um, I'm calling today with a bit of concern over the project. Uh, while I am in favor of bringing lots of 
jobs to Nashville. The first question that emerges is under who these jobs would be for, what kind of community benefits are actually being structured within the deal, of which uh, residents of Nashville have not necessarily been included upon. Um, my concerns rely around attracting talent from elsewhere while not necessarily understanding the kind of job training opportunities that would be available for urban residents who are not going to be able to have the skill sets that match the kind of employment opportunities that will uh, emerge through Oracle arriving here. Um, the next point that I would like to make is, in general, in an area that's already experiencing rampant gentrification due to real estate-driven um, urban development and densification and profit before people, um, I would prefer to have a more community-oriented process where individuals can actually be included around the kinds of economic impacts that are more inclusive. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next caller. You have the next caller. Thank you. Just introduce yourself and then you have the Yes. Hi, my name is Dan Fitzpatrick, and I live at 1706 Northview Avenue here in town. And I just wanted to say that first, thank you for allowing me to speak and for serving on this board. Uh, you all have a very challenging job of both peering into the future and then trying to put us on the right path to turn that vision into a reality. So that's not easy, and, and I really appreciate your all's vision. Um, now, when thinking about the future, something I do wonder is come 2051, <laughs> I know Nashville will be here. I can't say the same thing about Oracle. Now, I'm very happy, excited that Oracle wants to move here and it's going to be great for Nashville. And even though deep down, I believe they would move here with or without any sort of if arrangement, I'm also a realist and I recognize there's broad support, both with the Metro Council, the business community, schools and throughout the city for this arrangement. <clears throat> so I wanted to propose trying to bridge sort of a gap between using this opportunity to help Nashvilleians in the present and thus kind of lifting up everyone to that vision that we all kind of share about the future. So I ask, is there any room to consider maintaining this 175 million public gift commitment to River North and Oracle only instead of having Oracle in the driver's seat on these projects, we bond this out and we build the pedestrian bridge and infrastructure as a city. Now, to be clear, nothing would change in this scenario with how we collect this money or the total amount. It would just change who gets to manage the public project and additionally would alleviate the pressure of us asking Oracle to solve some of our societal problems for us. This would fall in line also with the values of the Get It Right Bill providing worker protections that the Metro Council will be passing about 30 minutes before they take up this Oracle issue. So yes, this would be a bit more expensive, but bond rates are in the low twos presently, and I think those extra fees are worth debating to ensure that we build this infrastructure in line with our values that you've heard about throughout this public comment period, as opposed to letting a private company who's incentivized to build this at the lowest possible cost do it. Now, there's also the argument that if we pursued this option, then we'd be on the hook for overages as opposed to or Oracle. I'd counter that we have a good clue already that River North infrastructure projects may be overestimated in that Mayor Cooper has already successfully negotiated the 20 million that we've allocated down to 13 million. My other counter would be that since we will be left to maintain all of this infrastructure, it could be in the best interest to pay more overages on the front end opposed to larger costs and fixing issues on the back end. So in summary, I think this alternate arrangement uh, would really be part of the true values and spirit of the Get It Right Bill in Nashville, while still providing Oracle with the 175 million that they requested. So thank you for your time and enjoy this beautiful day. Thank you very much. Next caller.
Welcome. Please state your name and you have three minutes. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Greg Zegan. I live at 111B Rosebank Avenue, uh, 37206. Uh, I want to thank everyone for uh, letting me call on today and voice uh, my concerns about this project. Uh, I've lived in Nashville for a few years now. Uh, after leaving another U.S. city, segregated by big tech like Oracle in San Francisco, in San Francisco has experienced both a boom in property value and in homelessness. And as non-tech workers were pushed further from the urban core in pursuit of affordability, their commutes became untenable. The security guard at my work would carpool with three other families, uh, making the commute twice a day, four hours, to and from Sacramento. In Sacramento, he could own a 200K home and send his kids to great schools. In San Francisco, he couldn't pay rent for a one-bedroom apartment with horrible schools. Now Nashville stands to profit as those same workers I a cheaper city with a better commute and years of life, years of their life restored. But will Nashville continue to make the same mistakes as San Francisco? Development is not immoral, unequal development is. Who determines if Nashville's have access, if Nashvillians have access to shelter, our elected officials, or Oracle? Nashville's development goals could be popular and impactful. Instead of GDP growth, we set goals on life expectancy growth. Instead of job growth, we target universal literacy. Instead of eliminating corporate tax, we eliminate poverty. Here are some of the things we lose when we beg massive corporations for the crumbs. Affordable housing, good schools, transit, parks, green energy, disaster recovery funds, and social services. Lacking these amenities, cities become unaffordable, traffic-ridden, polluted, and gentrified. We've already robbed our citizens of millions of dollars through corporate welfare for Amazon's richest shareholders. Are the unelected billionaires accountable to the people of Nashville and its leaders on this call? For our leaders to hold in step. I, I accept that these situations are negotiations and the intentions for the people of Nashville may be very good. However, Nashville does not need Oracle's job to reduce its poverty, improve its literacy rate, or extend its average life expectancy. Rather, without appropriate taxation and policy reform, Oracle's presence will only exacerbate these issues. We live in the richest country in the world and provide less to our citizens than some of the world's most exploited nations. Institute rent control, secure community members with new transit routes, and housing, require a, a quota of local workers, ask for more tax dollars, fund tech training in our schools and prisons, invest in the community, and many more companies will be competing for Nashville's tax. I don't think that anyone intends to do harm here by encouraging development with Oracle. And I don't think that anyone wants Oracle to skip on investing in the neighborhood, but we can shape that investment. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Next caller. Oh, yeah, I'm about to put through. Hello, um, can you identify yourself and you have three minutes? Yes, good morning, everyone. I'm Tony Petrenikoff. I live at 7368 Riverfront Drive, and thank you all for taking the time to listen in on our thoughts and concerns. I know you have a very uh, important decision to make this morning. And I must say that I agree that the Oracle Club is very exciting and has a lot of potential to benefit the city, but I do have uh, a very critical concern. And one is that this deal, as is, doesn't take into account the needs and input of Nashvilleans themselves. Nashvilleans weren't uh, necessarily included in the drafting process. And so this project hasn't necessarily reached its full potential of reflecting and benefiting Nashville as a city. And on top of that, we as Nashvilleans are working on an uphill battle of trying to say what we would like to see and try to revise what's going on. And so Mayor Cooper mentioned the what and why project, which is extraordinarily important. But a central question that still remains in my mind is how. And the how really matters. The questions around how we will ensure these new jobs will be going to Nashville and how will we make sure this does not place additional burden on displacing residents already here. How will we make sure infrastructure jobs will go to Nashville contracts? And another concern I have is the astounding speed at which this process is going. Only a week and a half to 
see what's going on in the news. That's how we pretty much all follow. Understand it, make any comments, and voice any concerns. And uh, one thing I want to add is I'm a scientist. And one thing I often worry about in, in my work in, in data science and uh, molecular science is a sampling size, which is where you set up uh, your setups for your experiments, your surveys lead to a misleading picture. And while um, one meeting is extraordinarily important to ensuring every uh, some comments are heard, it unfortunately doesn't allow everyone to how to voice their concerns. It won't allow teachers for taking care of our students. Um, it won't allow construction workers, nurses and doctors who are either sleeping after a night shift or taking care of patients right now to voice their concerns. And this, unfortunately, is not going to be some sort of experiment that can be redone and reevaluated. This will impact the living experiences and challenges Nashvilleians face for at least the next 20 years. And so I'm asking you all to please consider deferring this vote, slowing things down, letting more for more chances for community members to think and speak about this. And so thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Next caller. We have the next caller. Thank you. Uh, welcome. Please state your name and you have three minutes. Madam Chair and Board, thank you for this opportunity. My name is Ralph Schultz. Uh, I'm a resident of Nashville at 6105 Montcrest Drive and the CEO of the Nashville Area Chamber. And uh, thanks for this opportunity to talk about uh, uh, this important project. You know, if there were a headline on this project, it would be strategic opportunity. Uh, the, the mayor did a great job of outlining all of the great benefits that are going to come to the city as a result of this project. Uh, 8,500 direct jobs. There will be another 11,000 jobs generated. A lot of those jobs are going to be in things like landscaping, food service, business services, uh, et cetera. But it's also going to create a critical mass in an important industry of the future, the digital industry. This is going to be one of those uh, strategic gains that's going to help Nashville uh, maintain its economic e equilibrium uh, into the future. We have a great reputation for resilience. We have a great reputation for uh, the minimal impact and downturns. And a lot of that has to do with the balance that exists in our economy. And the arrival of this project in Nashville is going to help uh, create some of that, uh, some of that uh, balance. You know, unique features in, in this proposal include that interest-free loan and the support of infrastructure development by the company on the, on the front end. Uh, the mayor mentioned the increase in tax revenue to the city, which is going to help fund additional uh, services throughout the city. Um, this is just a great strategic opportunity for the residents of Nashville, and it helps us create an industry in the digital arena that is uh, is going to be important to Nashville's future. A couple of final comments. First of all, congratulations to the company for uh, its transparency. It's put out a lot of information uh, with regards to its intent coming here and it has a great track record of community support, especially in the education arena. And I think we're all going to benefit from that. We've seen a lot of recent arrivals to Nashville invest in the community. And I think this company intends to do the same thing. And then finally, a lot of great opportunity for comment. It's one of the reasons we have a Metro Council is for residents to uh, communicate with their Metro Council members. So. Uh, this public hearing and the opportunity to, to comment to Metro Council, uh, both great features going forward as these decisions get made. So uh, thank you for this opportunity to comment and uh, thank you all for sitting, uh, making this decision. Thank you. Next caller.
Thanks, Harlan. Good morning. Introduce you to yourself and you have three minutes. Thank you so much. My, my name is Simone Boyd and I live on Eta Street, Nashville, Tennessee, 37208. I'm calling to request a delay in the vote or a no vote. Um, like many other people said, I have a lot of concerns about how this is happening and the speed of what is happening. The person before me talked about an interest-free loan, and I believe he's with the, cha with the chamber. Um, I feel like Nashville regular residents like me have not had enough time to process this or understand what's happening. I've read about jobs. I've heard about a cleanup of the dump, but I don't, I haven't had enough time to understand what is happening. And I'm curious, how long has the chamber and how long has the visitors Bureau known about this deal? I think regular citizens like me deserve just as much time to process and understand what's happening. My second concern is around accountability. I think that there needs to be a robust measure of accountability. If they're saying they're going to have these jobs and they're going to invest in education, there needs to be fees, fines, contributions to the Barnes Funds if they don't answer on their promises. And I think we have a great example in the Community Benefits Agreement that Stand Up Nashville negotiated with the MLS several years ago. Finally, I have a question about trash. Um, currently, our dumps are almost near capacity. They will be at capacity in a few years, and Bordeaux takes a lot of the city's trash. Um, ironically, I'm hearing or I've read that Oracle is planning to clean up the, the dump for that area downtown, but they need to be making a plan to clean up the dumps in North Nashville because we cannot take trash from another 8,500 people, and I think it's unjust that they would expect us to do that. So I want to see a plan for trash cleanup of Bordeaux and also where the trash will be going from all this construction that will happen. Um, again, thank you so much for listening. Thank you to Stand Up Natural and Equity Alliance for am amplifying this issue. And have a nice day. Thank you so much. Appreciate your comments. Next caller. Hello, welcome. Introduce yourself and you have three minutes. Okay, uh, my name is Jamie Rabin, and I live at 4805 Nebraska Avenue, Nashville, Tennessee, 37209. And I think that the vote about the Oracle project should be um, delayed until there can be more of an opportunity for um, public input. Uh, and there's also just a lack of transparency about the project and the impact on the neighborhood that it'll have and a uh, lack of opportunity for uh, residents to um, weigh in on the project. Uh, so I, I just ask that the vote be delayed. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. I appreciate your call. Next caller. You have the next caller. Thank you. Just introduce yourself and you have three minutes. Uh, hi, Marguerite Bean. Um, I'm from the 27214 zip code. And I would just like to start off by saying I too am worried about the lack of public input in this deal. Um, and like Simone was saying before, just wondering how much, you know, the public hasn't really had time to process this. Um, this still needs to be put off so that you can actually listen more to what the people are saying, especially folks in the area that will be taken over by Oracle. Um, and Mayor Cooper, you say this will be a win for affordable housing, but what's the plan there? Um, the actual plan this has been promised in other projects before, and we are still in an affordable housing crisis. And so I just wanted to call in and put some pressure on to um, make that happen. You know, we are watching. And also, um, as some other folks have stated, you say that some of the jobs we put aside for Davidson County residents, um, but that's kind of vague. We, we would like some actual numbers so that we can we, the public, can make opinions on it and, you know, so the public here can actually benefit from that. 
you need to listen to the folks who actually live here and especially the folks who live in that area. What kind of impact is that going to have on them, on that community? Um, it's very important to take that into consideration and the harm that it could potentially do, especially for the affordable housing um, that is currently that could currently is currently in that area. So um, those are my concerns, very similar to a lot of the other concerns on here. So uh, thank you and have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much. Next caller. Welcome. Introduce yourself and you have three minutes. Hi, my name is Sarah Olson. Um, I live in the 37207 area code and my family moved down here in 2018. Um, so I just represent myself. Um, and I first want to start out by thanking you for hearing my call. And um, yes, and and thank you for being patient with this whole call-in process. I'll try to be brief. Um, I do support deferring or a no vote on this matter, and here are my reasons. Um, I am concerned about the lack of transparency in this process. I am particularly concerned about any potential conflicts of interest between the industrial board members, Governor Lee, Mayor Cooper, and Oracle. I am concerned about who will profit from this and who will be left behind. Second, I do wonder if any identified risks of bringing to Oracle have been acknowledged. Um, I will be the first to admit I haven't read all the notes, although I've been trying to keep up. I do know um, coming from a contractor standpoint, that $175 million is not much when it comes to a project of this scale. Uh, steel costs alone uh, went up 300% since April 1st. And so the infrastructure piece is crucial here. And vague promises around reasonable efforts are simply not going to cut it. Um, we need to be sure that the most vulnerable Nashvilleians are protected. We're already in a housing crisis and linking any corporate promises to completion or beginnings of a development project is simply a recipe for disaster. My, my daddy was a contractor and he always told me if it uh, sounds to be too good to be true, it probably is. And so I think we need a more thorough review. We need to hear from the people that are going to be most impacted from this. And we need a solid commitment to actual, literal, affordable housing based on income, not based on average home prices, but based on people's income. This is critical, and it is why we are currently in a housing crisis right now. So I am again asking to defer or no vote on this. And we need more information as citizens. I know that the governor and the mayor both understand that we cannot be taxed without representation. We need representation here. And so please defer on this vote. Uh, we do not need to wind up as some folks in Flint with a water crisis. Um, we already have massive unmet infrastructure needs, $175 million will not be sufficient to cover those costs. And I yield my time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next caller. Good morning. Introduce yourself and you have a few minutes. Good morning, my name is Benjamin Walker, 815 Joyce Lane 37216. I'm a neighbor in Nashville District 8 and an organizer in Red Door Collective. On April 14th of this year, I woke up to a couple of news articles heralding plans for Austin-based tech giant Oracle to make a move to Nashville. Not even two weeks and I have read no fewer than one dozen articles discussing this plan. Every story talks about Oracle moving as if the deal has already been signed. 
And I won't go through the num numerous points that they make about the development of our city, but rather I would like to speak to some of the past promises we've heard, our current housing situation, and some of the key issues that make this deal a threat to our most vulnerable computer communities rather than a boat that can lift us all in unity. 22 years ago, Nashville made a 40-year deal with Dell Computers. Our community was told to expect 3,000 jobs in the first five years and as many as 10,000 in the following years. In exchange, Nashville gave a 40-year tax abatement as long as Dell kept more than 1,500 jobs during that time. 20 years later, Dell has only created 1,750 jobs. We gave cash and tax incentives to Amazon, to Amazon, one of the largest corporations in the history of man, to grow their business even more in our backyard. This pattern is not a single instance, but what seems to be the way business continues to be done, and the residents of Nashville continue to get little or no say about it. This is corporate welfare that benefits a few, and cost burdens remain squarely on the shoulders of the working people of Nashville. The housing crisis in Nashville is nothing new been a problem for more than a decade now. From 2012 to 2018, national housing costs rose 89%. The median rate for pay rate for black workers dropped 10% from 2007 to 2017, while white working wages rose a mere 2.4%. Landlords in Nashville are allowed up to legally discriminate against tenants by refusing to rent to people who use Section 8 vouchers to subsidize their rent payments. In studying the eviction process in Davidson County and working to educate myself of our current climate, I've heard many stories. Sales of property managers refusing payments from resources such as Metro Action Council, uh, Section 8 recipients being told they are no longer allowed to renew their lease as properties will be rented to others at market rate. One story of two young men who lost their mother last December and are now homeless because the landlord would no longer accept the vouchers and is continuing to sue them for the market value of the rent that they could not pay. So, development happens, affordable housing is priced by ever-increasing property value, market rates continue to increase, and wages stay stagnant or go down. This results in the displacement of the very people who make up the base of our workforce. The continued development of finance and corporate power without taking into consideration our por poorest communities is violence. Mayor Cooper makes some grand gestures with Affordable Housing Task Force that includes developers, lawyers, MDHA representatives, and more. But what, represent, what representation do the poor have on these boards? He promises more cash for affordable housing, but why should we believe him? We've heard it all before, and a 10-year plan is only as good as the next well-to-do socialite who takes power. In other words, not at all. As our government continues to perpetuate this violence on its most vulnerable people, it is no wonder to see the pain become more and more visible in our neighborhood. To ignore the telltale signs of suffering communities and continue with the same business as usual is to be complicit and therefore guilty of colonization and ultimately a slow genocide of poverty leading to early death. Families are forced to relocate and separate. Communities are destroyed. The ripple effect of what you do now in closed rooms will be far, felt far in the future. I would urge you to defer this proposal. Go talk to the working poor who continue to build this city despite the burden of corporate welfare on their backs. Take a survey of what our neighbors need and be transparent with your intentions. Show us the fine print detail of the deal and explain what the sudden sense of urgency is. Offer real solutions to our current issues rather than continuing to prop up these deals with platitudes and empty, unenforceable promises, earn our trust. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next caller. Next caller. Uh, hello. Good morning. Introduce yourself and you have three minutes. Hello, you're recognized. Introduce yourself and you have three minutes to make comments. We may have lost the caller, Charday. Okay, give us one second to get another caller through. Okay. Thank 
you have the next yeah. caller. Thank you. Good morning. Um, introduce yourself. You have three minutes to make comments. Good morning. This is Kristen Campbell. I'm at 1034 West Eastland at uh, 37206. So I am not too far from the proposed project. Um, and living in East Nashville, I try to stay in tune to what's going on. And I read about this uh, proposed project back in February. And so first I was skeptical, you know, like many people have said, there's a lot of development going on. So, um, but I did the research, uh, looked a little bit at Oracle and after looking at what they proposed, I think this is going to be a great opportunity for Nashville. And I really wish people would be a little bit more open to all of the amazing benefits that are going to come from this proposed project and um, and how it's going to trickle down and impact our schools positively um, and our neighborhoods. You know, there's a huge connectivity problem that so many people have brought up um, in the Jefferson Street corridor. And the fact that Oracle has included some solutions to that connectivity, you know, through the pedestrian bridge and some other infrastructure that they've proposed it means that it shows that they have a pulse on the community and, and they're trying to understand what we need and what we want. And I, I think people should realize too that this is still very early on in the process. This is, you know, the first step in many and there's going to be a lot of opportunity for public comment. Um, there's going to be a lot of opportunity for the community to weigh in. And, you know, from what I've seen that Oracle's done um, in other cities, they want to be a part of the community. They don't come in like a bull in a china shop. They they want to get to know, you know, the neighborhoods and, and the people that are in the neighborhoods. And so I'm I'm very positive, you know, optimistic that that they're going to do that here in Nashville um, and listen to our concerns. And you know, I think the last thing that I'd say is that this is just a good opportunity for people if they have concerns, like we're doing now, talking about them. Um, there's there's opportunities for a lot of these um, concerns with affordable housing and, and who's getting these jobs and, and some of these details. I think those are things that um, can definitely be worked out here in the near future as, as this whole project moves forward. And I thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Next caller. Welcome. Introduce yourself and you have three minutes. Thank you so much. My name is Kristen Dillard. I'm a Nashville resident at 2310 Elliott Avenue. But I am asking you to delay the Oracle project vote. Um, Nashvilleians deserve answers to the questions that have been raised by Stand Up Nashville and other um, community organizations around the transparency and financing of the Oracle project, as well as the local and equitable recruitment for jobs created by this project. Um, so thank you for taking my public con comments. Let's continue to deepen the transparency between um, what are uh, uh, the deals that we are making and the uh, benefits that it's actually giving to the folks who are in need. Thank you very much. Next caller. Thank you. Welcome to the Industrial Development Board public hearing. Introduce yourself and you have three minutes for comment. Hi, my name is Todd Valentine. I live at 1521 Wendell Avenue, Nashville 37206. And I just want to say that I am against uh, Oracle coming to Nashville. Uh, Nashville brands itself as a creative city, but I feel uh, city leaders have continued to prioritize money over helping artists and small businesses. Uh, I feel Nashville brands itself as a friendly city, but our city leaders continue to stand by while our poorest lifelong residents and most vulnerable are displaced. Uh, I feel this Oracle deal is just another example of our city leaders uh, selling us out in return uh, for financial gain. And I feel that as a, a citizen, I don't really see the benefits of these mega deals. I just get the decreased quality of life and increased traffic, uh, property taxes, 
uh, you know, more dangerous streets to walk on from additional housing. So I just hope uh, that is taken into consideration. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming and giving us your thoughts. Next caller. Welcome. Please introduce yourself. You need three minutes. Sally Carlson Bancroft, 8421 Poplar Creek Road, Nashville, 37221. I'm calling to urge the board to postpone decision on the ORA project, the River North Infrastructure Economic Impact Plan, because I don't think that there's been sufficient time for community input. And I think we can have get a better deal than what I've read about in the paper. Thank you. Thank you very much for your call. Next caller. Thank you. Welcome to the public hearing of the Industrial Development Board. Please state your name and you have three minutes. Yep, my name is Michael Kershaw. I live at 818 Lushy Avenue, uh, Nashville 37207. I live only a few blocks from the proposed development in an area that I think uh, already has a lot of relatively low income housing uh, that is slowly disappearing and in pretty rough shape. And I do have concerns over the proposed development, uh, the impact of the, the low income housing and what that really means to the community and any impacts that might have on uh, homelessness or crime in the area. So I'd like to propose delaying the vote uh, and or no vote today. Uh, thank you and for your comments. Thank you very much. Charde, next caller, please. Caller, you're on. Thank you. Introduce yourself if you have three minutes. Hello, I, did not understand. I could not understand what you just said. Um, but you can call Natalie. I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, what I said was introduce yourself and then you have three minutes. Okay, well, you can call me Natalie because I'm transsexual and I'm not going to out myself or expose myself to violence. Normally, I would not consider that relevant that I'm transsexual, but when people like the Equity Alliance are making identity part of this, then I think it becomes relevant. I own a home in Nashville. I work in a back office job at a major corporation, just a little bit smaller than Oracle, but we're still very large. Our office looks like the United Nations. We're all colors, all religions, all genders, all sexual orientations. As I said, I'm transsexual and I'm in an interracial relationship. And both my interracial boyfriend and I, not only did we vote for Trump, but these people in Stand Up Nashville and Equity Alliance do not at all represent us. Not a bit. Matter of fact, these people, Charlene Oliver is a professional politician. She says she wasn't consulted about this deal. I don't know why she wasn't, because she is a professional politician running against Tim Cooper. Odessa Kelly of Stand Up Nashville is a professional politician. I'm sorry, he's the one running against Jim Cooper. Charlene Oliver was his community liaison and part of his congressional staff. Toby Gardner and Sean Joseph are executives in the Metro Nashville Public Schools. So these are the special interest group. Now, what are they talking about? A quote here, um, Char Charlene Oliver said, black residents more than any other demographic have felt the negative impacts of what deals like Oracle 
spring to our rapidly changing neighborhoods. Well, I don't know what you mean because where I work, there are a whole lot of black people in our office. Many of them are women, and I wasn't given any trouble getting hiring, you know, because I'm transsexual. Nobody cares about that in the office world. So uh, is Charlene Oliver saying that black people are not going to get these jobs? And if she's saying that, why? And what exactly do they want? Because I object to pretty much everything they ask for. Um, I want my employer to be able to ask whether somebody has a criminal record. But these people are trying to say that the employer should not be able to ask that question. That's what they mean by being the box. This is a terrible idea. Nobody elected these organizations, Equity Alliance, Nobody elected these people. They don't represent us. Our elected government already made this deal with Oracle, and this deal needs to stand. Thank you for your time. Oh, thank you, Natalie. Next caller. Welcome. Introduce yourself, and you have three minutes. Hello, my name is Candace. I'm near Lafayette. I live at 364 Day Drive in Nashville, Tennessee, 37211. And I just first want to thank you all for the opportunity to get to speak, and especially everyone before me who has voiced concerns about deferring the vote. I'm here to express that very same view. And thank you to Stand Up Nashville and the Equity Alliance. Because of them, it's come to my attention that there are very many unanswered questions when it comes to transparency, safety, jobs, racial equity, um, concerning this proposal with Oracle. So it seems to be a serious lack of community input. My question is, has Oracle or any city officials spoken with local residents in the affected development area? And if so, what was the feedback? And I'm hearing a lot of people talk about job opportunities for people in our community. So what percentage of well-paid jobs can Oracle guarantee will go to current Davidson County residents? And what plans are there to recruit and hire Black and Hispanic or Latino residents for these well-paid positions? Because just looking at numbers from their 2018 Equal Employment Opportunity Report, it shows very small numbers for executives and senior officials and managers who were black, Hispanic, or Latino. Um, I think it's really cool, I will say, that they are having plans for partnerships with HBCUs, being an HBCU graduate myself. However, I'd like to know what other public investments are being made in the local black economy. And my other concern just goes to safety. Um, who are these people that are going to have building this infrastructure like bridges that are very, very dangerous to construct. Um, I just want to say let's hold the city accountable when it comes to conducting business and actually considering the community it's affecting. Once again, I just want to reiterate that we should defer the vote. And thank you so much. Thank you, and I appreciate your call. Next caller. Okay. Welcome. Introduce yourself and you're recognized for three minutes. Yes. Uh, my name is Bill Munson. Uh, I am uh, both a business and property owner at uh, 407 West Trinity Lane. Uh, my wife Sue and I invested 14 years ago in the River North area. And six years ago, ago we broke ground to build our new campus. Uh, and provide a quality preschool uh, facility to a, an area that we recognize is terribly diverse. Um, we, we like to say we were BLM before that was a thing. Um, and quite frankly, high paying jobs, and I, you know, I understand that there's concern about uh, affordability, but they create the need for smaller businesses like ours to continue employ, employing teachers whom we can never pay enough. Uh, we face 
a political climate where there is pressure uh, to increase minimum wages and we to treat all of our uh, employees uh, fairly, we need to, that means we need to increase everybody's wages, which we welcome, uh, but we can't do that without uh, companies and recognized companies like uh, this project supports. Um, we have initiated uh, the, a group called NICSNI, uh National North by Northeast, to engage our local community in decision making. Uh, I was steering committee member to develop the Haynes Trinity uh, policy amendment because our area, area is not well understood. Uh, we've supported affordable development and improving infrastructure. Our teachers uh, need to live and work in our community. Uh, we need initiatives like this to, to increase our infrastructure. Uh, both my wife and I have life, lifelong careers in the technology space. Uh, Oracle is a long-standing, respected innovator that's not going away. And uh, quite frankly, we fully support this uh, introduction to provide those high-value job opportunities and address uh, our experiences to operate our business in an area that really suffers from lack of infrastructure. And that's the end of my comments. Thank you, sir. I appreciate you calling. Next caller. Welcome. Introduce yourself and you have Good morning, members of the IDB. James Weaver, 6504 Jocelyn Hollow, 37205. Thank you for uh, what you do for our city and thank you for the opportunity to address you this morning. I'm specifically going to talk about the need for delay and the alleged lack of transparency that several callers have brought up this morning. Um, the development of the infrastructure on the new Oracle campus is completely consistent, 100% con consistent with the River North UDO, the underlying River North zoning, and two participation agreements, all of which have been approved multiple times by the Metro Council. These agreements and the underlying zoning and the infrastructure that's contained therein is the subject or has been the subject of 17 separate votes at council over the last four and a half years. Most of those votes receiving 38 or 39 council members voting for it. Today is the ninth public hearing going back to 2018, dealing with the infrastructure that is the subject of your debate today. The River North development and the infrastructure package that is before you today is the most discussed, the most voted on, the most publicly debated development in the history of our city. The project and the infrastructure package that again is part of the council approved UDO and Oracle's proposal is consistent with that is the culmination of the hard work of four different mayors, three different planning directors, three different public works directors, and over 60 members of the Metro Council over two consecutive council terms. All of the work that is before you, every inch of asphalt, every yard of concrete, every bridge, every overpass, every underpass, every pedestrian bridge has been publicly debated and voted on numerous times. Please act and please act today. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, members of the board. Thank you. Next caller. The next caller. Welcome. Introduce yourself, and you have three minutes. Good morning, and thank you so much for uh, taking the time to listen to our comment today. Um, my name is uh, Taylor Hall. I live at 301 Demumbrian Street in Nashville, um, and I am speaking in support of the proposed project at River North um, because of the opportunity that it uh, that is presented to our city. Um, it's additive to the city's general fund. Um, the tax revenue that we're sharing at Oracle does not exist. 
Um, we're not having to front any of the money up front, not having to add on to our already large city debt. Um, in addition, all local option sales taxes will still go to the city. Um, it'll spur more development all the way down the East Bank and across the river in Germantown, um, which will inc uh, increase tax collections as well. Um, another big opportunity is that it raises Nashville's profile as a tech destination and tech hub. Um, tech talent will be attracted to Oracle's hub um, here, and it presents a great opportunity for Davidson County residents attending our colleges, um, various computer boot camps um, to get a, a to get a very um, good paying, high paying job. Um, for And you know, finally, Oracle seems to be a good corporate citizen everywhere else they do business. They've got a perfect score in the HRC Equality Index. I mean, they're a perfect partner for NNPS, National State, I mean, the city's uh, various HB, HBCUs and other colleges. Um, and with that, uh, I urge you to not defer voting on this and to vote in favor of the project. Thank you. Thank you, next caller. Welcome. Introduce yourself. And you have Good morning, board members. Um, my name is Adam Barris, 109 Abbey Wood Drive, Nashville, Tennessee, 37215. Uh, I am a uh, supporter of the Oracle addition to Nashville. I believe the tax revenue is uh, going to have a long-term impact on many of the issues that we currently see in our city. Uh, including um, <clears throat> including our uh, issues with education, infrastructure. Um, this is not a solution for everything. It also isn't the epidemic issue of everything either. So I, I know you have a lot to deal with, and I just wanted to say that uh, please identify this as a one-off situation and not the uh, uh, crops of every issue that we have in the city. Uh, I appreciate your time, and I appreciate your hard work. Thank you, and have a great day. Thank you. Next caller. Welcome. You have three minutes to introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Rory Hoffma, and I live um, on Lawndale Drive in the zip code 37211 in South Nashville. I am here today um, to ask you to defer the vote regarding the Oracle project. Um, I do not have necessarily um, disagree with the project. I disagree with the process of community, in, um, of having uh, enough time for community impact. I, um, I personally have only been aware of this um, very recently. I don't think that there's been enough time for um, many people impacted to have um, a say in how this is done. I also have an issue with very large tax incentives that are given out for multiple years. And I believe this one is for 25 years. Um, in addition, I believe housing and the other issues that some speakers before me have brought up are um, primary issues to consider. Um, the neighborhood immediately impacted housing issues citywide, um, truly having um, more access to truly low um, income families to live in the city. I also want to talk about environmental impact. I live in South Nashville. My neighborhood was recently, um, I live near Mill Creek. Many houses in my neighborhood were destroyed by the recent flood. Many more were destroyed in 2010. And I believe development around this city does not take proper environmental um, issues into consideration. Um, or with climate change, there's gonna be more big storms. We're gonna have a 100 year storm every year. And we need this city to take care of the proper way to have these huge new projects come to town without um, growing neighborhoods. I thank you for the time. I thank you to Equity Alliance and Stand Up Nashville for informing me about this process. And um, I urge you to defer this vote 
so there can be more community input. Thank you. Thank you, and I'm sorry for the damage that you and your neighbors had with the flood. Next caller. Welcome. Three minutes. Introduce yourself. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Charlene Oliver. I live at 4532 Queens Lane, 37218. Um, thank you for taking my comment and all the comments that have been said today. <clears throat> um, I just want to um, ask the board to delay this vote for several reasons. <clears throat> the community has not had a lot of input on this. Um, I am speaking as a resident of Nashville. For 20 years, I have seen the growth of this city um, change, and I have seen the fabric of the city, the people, change. Uh, I am speaking as someone who has worked for several minimum wage jobs in this city, and it is hard to get ahead when you are working minimum wage. I have seen, I am speaking also as a mother with two kids in public schools in this, in this city, and I am concerned. I am concerned how we are doing business in this city and how it is putting the burden on working class people in this city to carry the burden so that our community can thrive. Uh, I heard the mayor say, um, you know, we're, this is not going to incur any debt on our city. However, I did not hear him talk about the 25 years of tax incentives that we are giving to Oracle. So yes, our taxpayer dollars are involved and that is 25 years of tax revenue that we will not be investing in schools, in housing, in roads, that Oracle is not paying. In 25 years, I will have grandchildren. That is how long they will not be paying taxes. And that is unacceptable in this city. We have gotten here in this affordable housing crisis because we have let the Oracle in Nashville afford us not pay their fair share of taxes. So that is unacceptable. I also thought I heard the commissioner say that they have been working on this bill for two years. Two years? and the public is just now coming to find out about that. This is a problem. So yes, we should not be having to go through a media blitz of the last month convincing us that this has been a, a good deal. If you've been working on this for two years, you've had two years to inform the public. So no, we need more time, just like you've had two years, we need more time to marinate on how Oracle is going to invest in Nashville. How are these 8,500 jobs, these people that are coming here, they're going to be sending their kids to our schools. Our kids don't even have textbooks. How are they investing in public schools in Nashville? Where are these people live? Walk down Diggerton Pike next to the site of where they're going to build in their, building their campus. There are mobile homes. There are liquor stores. That, the area they are in building in is a distressed neighborhood. And we are going to push some people out and build a housing that they cannot afford. So yes, we are changing and transforming the people who live here. And they do not look like me. The people I went to college with 20 years ago, they come back and visit Nashville and it is not the same. And they say, where are the black people? Where are the people of color? If, are we okay with that as a city? That we are calling ourselves a welcoming city, but we are pushing the, the diversity out. So I ask you to delay this vote, give us more time, allow our officials to hold an oracle seat to the fire, to give us more details. We need more details on how those 8,500 jobs are going to be invested in people who live here. We need more um, uh, questions on how <clears throat> they are going to work with uh, our HBCU. We have heard this before. We, we've seen the game being talked, but we don't see the materialization. <clears throat> so we need this in writing. We need Oracle to, <clears throat> excuse me, we need Oracle to provide more detail. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller.
Hey, hey. Hello, you have three minutes to introduce yourself first. Hi, this is Kay Bowers, and thank you for the opportunity to speak to you all today about this important uh, initiative. I too think it's valid and important to put a pause on this vote <clears throat> for these reasons. We do have an impact study that's done, uh, but what's missing in cities today, and we're in Nashville to take the lead, is an impact study done on the neighborhoods around the area in terms of housing affordability and supply, in terms of displacement risk, and then the development of a plan to mitigate those risks. Our jobs are in a bifurcation looking space, which means that the jobs in the middle are being hollowed out. The jobs at the bottom are growing and there's a small number of jobs that are growing at the top. So if the trends, the 10 year trend shows that the job production in the future is gonna be for those at incomes below or at wages below 44,000, then what kind of housing do we need for those people at those wages? That should be looked at and addressed. Uh, our hospitality sector employs a lot of people, but those people are struggling to live closer to their jobs and they're being pushed out. For those of us that have families in Seattle and in Oakland and in San Francisco, and we know what it looks like, it's, uh, it's a tough picture. So I ask you to pause and consider this and take the time to do the kind of impact study that should be done and include our community in a wider engagement process. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bowers. Next caller. Welcome. You have three minutes. Introduce yourself. Um, hi, this is, uh, this is Sean Parker. I live at 108 Minette Court, um, a council member for the 5th District, um, where the River North development proposal is. Um, so I've, I've talked a lot with uh, my constituents and neighbors um, over the last, oh, well, really this whole term um, about this proposal. There's, there's certainly a lot of excitement about the some of the infrastructure elements, the connectivity and whatnot. Um, but the, the overwhelming concern in the community is around um, affordable housing or housing affordability generally. Um, I think that we really, framing this as a win for affordable housing, um, I'm not super familiar with council member Suarez's proposal, but as I am guessing it would, it would sort of declare our intent to dedicate the non-schools portion of the anticipated increment. Um, that'd be about $5 million once this is fully constructed and assessed is, is my understanding, that non-schools portion of the increment. Um, so, you know, adding $5 million to the Barnes Fund, while, while certainly a, a, a good thing, is, is not going to nearly offset the impact that um, a moving a company like Oracle into the urban core will have. Um, so I, I think that we need to, if we're going to address housing affordability in Nashville, if this is going to remain a city where the folks who build it, the folks who serve it, and the folks who work here can afford to live, I mean, step one of that is being honest about the impact of these, you know, deals that the city is pursuing, these policies the city is pursuing. Um, and, and, and I think that, that, again, I appreciate 
council members for and the, the mayor, you know, trying to come up with something that might um, help. But, but again, we're talking about seven or eight years down the line, if this is built and assessed, maybe adding $5 million to the Barnes Fund. Um, that is just, that is not going to offset the negative impact um, on housing affordability um, in the urban core. Um, and additionally, um, you know, this, this, uh, this notion of, you know, there's been plenty of time. I mean, I, I, I appreciate getting things when I do get them, but, you know, I, I got some, you know, major updates about this project last week and as early as I was able to schedule a community meeting to inform my folks about that is tomorrow after the vote. So um, I, I do, I do, um, it, it would have been great to have a little more information a little earlier so that I could uh, better inform my constituents and get feedback from them. So anyway, I know it's been a long meeting. I appreciate the board members for your service. Um, thank you very much and, and y'all have a great day. Thank you very much, council member, and I uh, appreciate you taking the time to call in. I anticipate if this moves forward, you will be involved for many years to come with this project. Uh, next uh, caller, please. Hi, my name is William Brake. I'm a homeowner in East Nashville residing at 1520 Strayway Avenue. Long time listener, first time caller. I work in tech and I love and support the Oracle deal as a win-win for Nashville with infrastructure and jobs coming online in the coming years and should help us rebound from the jobs loss due to COVID. Thank you. Thank you for your time and please approve this deal. Thank you for your call. Next caller. Welcome, you are recognized for three minutes. Just introduce yourself first. Hi, my name is Terry Holland. My uh, address is 2506 Trevecca Avenue, Nashville, Tennessee, 37206. You're recognized to my comments. All right. I'm just demanding that we get more uh, defer, uh, deferral on this uh, option on Oracle uh, while I stand up uh, Nashville, get more answers, uh, questions answered about the process of this. Thank you for calling and I appreciate your comments. Thank you. Next caller. You are recognized. Introduce yourself and you have three minutes. Hey, yes, my name is Alicia Wynn. I am at 1317 Timber Valley Drive in Nashville, 37214. I uh, first want to say thank you for the opportunity to comment today. Um, I am a member of the National Pro Professional Services and Consulting Community, and I'm also um, a native Nashvilleian. Um, so my interests and concerns are twofold, um, both as a professional as someone, and also as someone who has sincere interest in ensuring that the right decisions are made um, for my hometown for Nashville. Um, as a professional with a background in technology, I'm encouraged by the opportunities that um, the Oracle agreement will provide as we seek to um, expand on the technical landscape um, of Nashville and the surrounding areas, as well as the benefits um, to complementary industries and organizations um, that uh, will benefit from 
again, increasing the technical landscape um, that will come with the, the Oracle um, arrangement. And then also as a native Nashvilleian um, and an active member of the community, I'm encouraged by um, the opportunity um, to supplement improvements to education, um, affordable housing, um, the opportunity to partner with other organizations that can literally bridge the gap, um, some of the gaps that we have with the community, including um, partnerships uh, similar to what Oracle has done with other communities, um, with organizations such as uh, the Boys and Girls Club, uh, UNCF, uh, Second Harvest, as well as opportunities um, with HBCUs, um, equipping um, that incredible group of um, students and young professionals with additional experiences that could be supplemented with the Oracle arrangement. Um, so I am in favor um, of moving forward with the vote. I encourage, however, the continuation of conversation um, and increasing uh, awareness and openness um, as the plans continue to evolve. Um, a lot of the concerns that were expressed are very valid. Um, and in order to continue to address and understand those concerns, I support moving forward with the vote. Um, so that the conversations and the learnings and uh, the collaboration can continue, um, it, again, um, with the plan of ensuring that we have the best solution for Nashville and all of the, the stakeholders who should benefit from um, an opportunity of this magnitude. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next caller. Thank you. Introduce yourself if you have three minutes. Yes, uh, my name is Katina Brown and I live um, um, on Madison Street, 37208. Um, I just wanna start off to say that um, I think this is a great opportunity for Nashville and um, having Oracle to come here. And um, I hope that you would um, continue with uh, voting for it or approving it. Um, but with that, I would like to say that um, I also support um, the work that Equity Alliance and Stand Up Nashville is doing. They have some very good points, but I just think they're going in the wrong direction. Um, let Oracle come. The leaders of those two great organizations sit at a round table and talk it out with um, our local leaders and um, Oracle's representatives to have, um, just like the last caller said, some input into the community with developing younger kids into um, training like the Girls and Boys Clubs and some of the other local clubs. Um, and I think that's a good uh, route to go. Um, also, what I'm not hearing people talk about is the juvenile crime and the crime in that particular area uh, where people are moving in into these beautiful homes and people are stealing things and breaking in their cars. So I think that's another element that um, everybody must uh, have uh, conversations about uh, with this new development. What do you do to, um, you know, stop the juvenile and the other types of crimes in the area? But I think this is a great opportunity and I hope that it's approved and we can move forward. Thank you. Thanks for your call. Next call. Hello, introduce yourself and you have three minutes. Hi, uh, my name is David Lee Myers. I live in 409 Wilkinson Lane in White House, Tennessee. I am not living in the metro, but I do intend to move. Um, I am calling to support the feral or a no vote on this Oracle investment. I've noticed that a lot of callers 
um, who have come call it support this investment, own a home, live in a wealthy neighborhood, or have a vested financial interest in the Oracle development. So I feel like I should call attention to that aspect. And I should also call attention to the decades-long history of displacement in Nashville um, at the hands of commercial investment and commercial interest um, from Jefferson Street to Black Bottom, the Capitol Hill redevelopment, um, to the gentrification in North and East Nashville, and seeing the detainer data um, in the past two months near McFerrin Park and the East Bank. Um, there have been over at least 20 detainer warrants filed in favor of eviction from an apartment complex called River Chase Apartments, and they are presently not renewing leases to a Section 8 voucher uh, residents. So I feel like all of this is connected, and I heard a caller saying, let's not make this the crux of every issue in Nashville, but I feel very strongly that all of this is interconnected, that there's a very clear narrative in history that um, supports um, the claim that commercial interest promotes uh, commercial investment tends to promote displacement, gentrification. And we can see this when people, predominantly black and brown people, are moving to more suburban areas, Gullitzville, Lebanon, uh, Antioch, and um, Mount Juliet are seeing increasing rates of migration from people outside that have lived in the downtown core for a while. So again, I'm just calling to um, support deferral or a no vote on historical investment until more people in the community have made their work. Thank you for your call. Next caller. You are recognized for three minutes. State your name. Hello, caller. You are recognized for comments. Just state your name. Hi, I'm Carol. Welcome. Um, you're open for comments. I'm sorry. Go ahead and make your comments. Thank you. Like I said, I'm Lauren Fitzgerald. I'm with the I'm the vice chair of the Jefferson Street United Merchants Association of Nashville, Jump Nashville. Our address is 1326B Rosa Parks Boulevard, 37208. I believe the Oracle Corporation project can be good for Nashville, but it should be for all of Nashville. I hope the Oracle Corporation's inclusion in our community includes a community benefits agreement that supports the sustainability of our current tech workforce while also contributing to the current strategic tech workforce development initiatives that are being engaged. Oftentimes, corporations like Oracle and Google come to cities and buy the businesses that are already doing the work. So what is actually going to be done to create new jobs instead of purchasing already built infrastructure? How does this benefit the Tennessee Titans? They have not engaged in, North Nashville in the North Nashville community over the past 20 years, although they practice in North Nashville. Has a heavy populated black team, but no real history of engaging the black community in Nashville, and then particularly North Nashville. What is Oracle going to do to support black businesses? Because of the institutional slave trade of the 17th century that corporate America is built on, corporations should have an obligation to support the growth and development of black communities, and that should be named and stated and acted on. I and Jump Nashville will support the movement with those conditions of inclusion. Thank you. Thank you for calling. We're ready for our next call.
have the next caller. Thank you very much. Introduce yourself and you are recognized for two minutes. Thanks so much. Uh, my name is Nicole Williams. I live at 4425 West Lawn Drive um, in Sylvan Park. So I am not a, a member of the immediate community, but I have been in Nashville my whole life. Um, I don't, I haven't been listening to the whole public hearing period, so I don't want to repeat what others have said. I'm sure they've said it more eloquently than I could ever hope to. Um, but I am calling into support of deferral on this item. Um, you know, I'm not exactly sure what a deferral would accomplish, depending on the length of the deferral, and I don't know, you know, what you guys were considering. Uh, but I do know that clearly members of the community are conflicted or skeptical about this. Um, so I feel like out of respect for people who feel like with this deal and historically they have been left out of the conversation, um, like the labor community, housing advocates, public education advocates, um, I think it makes sense to respect um, the wishes of these like historically marginalized communities. Um, I don't know that there's any particular rush on this deal, although there always seems to be a rush on everything. Um, but I do think it makes sense to just give some more time, let people have more input. I think this, like other deals, there's been kind of a lack of full transparency um, and you know, I think what, what has happened in the past clearly has not worked for communities um, that are, you know, mostly affected by deals like this. Um, and capitalism is not a cure-all. The free market does not solve everything. We've seen that. We've made plenty of deals, and we still have plenty of people experiencing homelessness. Our schools are underfunded. Um, and we still don't have a, a pattern of bringing people who are going to be most directly affected to the table. Um, so I think it would be in the community's best interest, in the city's best interest, to just slow down and put a pause on this. Um, so that's all I have to say. Thank you so much. I know you guys have been listening for a while now, uh, and I really appreciate the work you do. Thank you very much for calling in. Next caller, Charter. Well, I'm on hold. I thought I was in line. I gave my name and address already. Do you want it again? Yes, because unfortunately, uh, no one except uh, the operator heard that. So if you don't mind so that the listening audience can hear it, just state your name and address again, and you're recognized for three minutes. Okay. Go ahead, the floor is yours. Ma'am, we're ready for the comments if you're ready. Okay, I'm ready. I'm Wilma's on. 1300 Riverwood Drive, Nashville, a resident for 40 years. And I have a lot of questions about Oracle. First of all, the 8,500 high paid workers, are they gonna be imported workers or are they gonna go to resident residents? Also, 8,500 more cars on our roads. If there's two people in the house, we'll have 17,000 cars. If they have two children, that's 34,000 more children in our schools. A bridge connecting Germantown and this area. I mean, these things don't seem at all in line in priority of what our politicians say they're going to do for Nashville. So I am totally against this right now. They should take it somewhere else, which needs it. We residents can't even afford parking downtown, let alone the amenities, and to bring this Short sided project here is irresponsible. They're saying they're going to give $175 million more in 20 years. Well, that $175 million is going to come from somewhere, and it's going to come from out of our pockets of our ever rising property tax. So please defer this, uh, get rid of it completely, and really take on the problems that we already have in Nashville caused by this influx. Thank you very much. Bye. 
Thank you. Next one. Hello, you're ready for the next three minutes. Just introduce yourself and address. Thank you. My name is Jonathan Vandenberg. I live at 1506 Forest Avenue in East Nashville, 37206. Uh, I know it's been a long meeting. I'll try to be very fast. Uh, I'm calling to support deferring this decision for today. Um, I sort of endorse all of the issues that were raised in the 20 questions um, that Stand Up Nashville published in the Tennessean. And, you know, from a personal point of view, I am what one of those callers earlier described as a resident in a relatively rich neighborhood um, where I, I likely would personally benefit from the deal in that, you know, real estate values will probably go up. But I'm not sure that that's good for the community. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've heard – I'm not a native Nashvillian. I can't tell you how many times I've heard native Nashvillians describe themselves as unicorns. And uh, there's a sense that, you know, working class natives of the city are an endangered species. And I think that trying to slow down the process um, to make it something that's truly inclusive of everyone in the community, maybe the terms of the deal wouldn't change in that in that discussion, but trying to slow it down seems like a worthwhile uh, undertaking. Thank you. Thank you. Caller? Thank you, Sarda. State your name, address, and then you are recognized for three minutes. Hi, I'm Lucas Leverett. I live at 1,039th Avenue North. Thanks for this forum. Um, I think I want to support this, but like almost every other good idea this town has been doing in the past decade, it feels dirty if we can't hold it to scrutiny. There is no need to rush this deal without accountability and deep answers, regardless, regardless of the rubber stamp that our linguistic leaders may or may not be handing out in discussions thus far. I once suggested to candidate Cooper that he needed to stop begging as a city. We've spent way too long groveling at in hand to be at the table for big deals. And we've been it city for plenty of time now, so it's time to negotiate like we matter instead of acting like we are lowly beggars with no agency. We cannot keep letting corporatism and greed kill the soul of this city unchecked. It's a great deal and a good chance to get stuff covered by one of these giants, maybe. But is it honest and on the up and up? And if so, it should be something that can stand up to honest answers. Our previous mayor almost sold us out to a crooked insider parking deal, so we have to be careful about the transparency on all of these. At least this has seen some of the light of day, but this stuff can slip very easily into the shadows or steamroll the people that truly matter before you know it. We definitely need to leverage this deal against the abusive conservative bullies on Capitol Hill and towards solutions for the actual working people in this city. Most of the people who we truly need to run this city and all the fat cat corporate beneficiaries of corporate welfare cannot afford to live here and have no transit options that truly matter for help for them. I'm a Nashville native, and my family and I are about to move away. When I was young, I wanted to leave this city because it wasn't where I wanted to be, but the kind of city I wanted to be in. Nashville grew to be a city that I'd love to stay in, and then spun out of control. Greed has been running this city, and we have to support efforts to combat that trend, or folks like us will never feel like we can come back home as an option. Most of our leaders hate it when I show up and ask the uncomfortable questions that no one wants to have to face, and I don't accept lame answers typically. So in that spirit, for now, I ask that you defer the vote until the tough questions are addressed. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Next caller.
Welcome, you're recognized for three minutes. Just state your name, please. Hi, my name is Jack. I live at 25 Stone. You're recognized to make your comments and you're cutting out just a little bit. Okay, um, I would like to start by saying I am much more well off financially than a lot of my neighbors um, and a lot of the people that I know here in Nashville. And even with that, I struggle to find affordable housing that isn't in terrible condition or run by exploitive owners. Um, the concerns I hear from my neighbors and the people who have already been pushed out of Nashville are real and deserve to be given strong consideration. Um, you've heard a number of comments about affordable housing, and I would like to affirm that that should be at the top of your priority list. Um, a question I have regarding housing is if the mayor's task force has been consulted on this issue, and if so, what their input is. Um, I would also like to mention once again the environmental impact that this amount of construction would create. Construction has some of the highest impact on the environment. The, while it's being built, the materials used and the energy used after it's built. Um, in the U.S., the construction sector contributes to 23% of air pollution, 40% of drinking water pollution, and 50% of land pollution. Another caller already mentioned the impact trash that this construction would have, and that is extremely important given that Nashville is already approaching mass capacity for its landfill. Um, there needs to be more investigation of the impact on this, especially since the plans are right on our riverfront, which is something that the city values. Um, I also have concerns about the safety of people who are actually going to build this campus. There have been a number of incidents of wage thefts, particularly for people in construction around Nashville. Um, and beyond just wage thefts, physical safety and the rush that is being put on constructing all of this is incredible. Um, I would like to remind people that on June 23rd of last year, a 16-year-old named Gustavo Enriquez Ramirez was on a job site at the La Quinta Inn Hotel and fell to his death. There was also a worker killed by a dump truck during a road repaving in East Nashville last year. Um, people have a lot of concerns, and the folks calling in to support this plan have essentially been taking Oracle at their word, ignoring the reality that many marginalized people face that huge companies will make promises that they do not intend to keep. Um, if the, this bill moves forward, there needs to be much more done to hold Oracle's feet to the fire. Um, I would ask you to either delay or vote no on this measure. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller. Welcome, you're recognized for three minutes. Just identify yourself, please. You are recognized. Caller, you are recognized to make comments. Sure, do we have a call? Oh, give us one second, Chair. We're going to see if we can get this caller. Uh, if not, uh, I think this may be the last one. Okay, thank you. Thanks for everybody bearing with the technology challenges. Hello, caller. You are recognized for three minutes. All right, thank you. Sorry about that. My name is Jason Miller. I live at 1403 Brentwood Terrace. Um, Nashville. That is District 27. And um, I'm calling to request that the, the vote to approve the Oracle deal be delayed so that we get better notice for public comment, particularly not during a working day on a Tuesday. Um, and if assistance is needed, I'm sure there are many, many people who will help with this. But people like myself who work during the day, um, and by the way, I'm on I'm on the clock, so 
the only way that I'm able to be a part of this meeting is because of the pandemic. And there are many people who are not um, as privileged as I am to, to be able to take this call, to, to be on this call. And so, respectfully, I would request that we delay the vote to get more public comment within each district, particularly within the affected district um, of the Oracle development on the East Bank, because individuals living on that side of the river, north or east, are often the most underserved and the most at risk for being pushed out of Metro. I do hope that we will address that. And that's all I have to say for now. Thank you very much. Sade, did I hear you say that was the last caller? Here we have more callers in the queue. One second. Okay. <laughs> Here you have the next caller. Thank you. Uh, welcome. You're recognized for three minutes. Just introduce yourself, please. Hello. Thank you. Uh, my name is Alex Berger, and I'm moving to Nashville uh, next month uh, into uh, on Albion Street in the City Heights neighborhood. And I'm moving to Nashville from California, like I think a lot of other people are right now. And I've been listening to the comments on the call. And, you know, I think there are definitely legitimate concerns when you look at a development of this scale and watching kind of how things have gone in Denver, Austin, I think are good examples of cities that have experienced a lot of economic growth and expansion over the last 10 to 15 years. Uh, you know, it is clear that it is important to think about things like transportation, infrastructure, housing, et cetera. Um, and those are all legitimate parts of the conversation around a, a uh, deal of this size. So I definitely want to acknowledge that those things are important. I just wanted to make a comment, a little bit bigger picture. Of, I think really what is being discussed here is what type of future do, do we want for Nashville? And obviously myself as not even a Nashville resident yet, um, kind of a different part uh, in that conversation, but I'll say, you know, I'm moving to Nashville because to me it looks like a city that has a lot of growth and opportunity and a kind of place where, you know, you could go to an amazing school, whether that's locally or somewhere else in the country, and then come back to Nashville, you know, to, to work one of these high paying jobs and be a community that, you know, people can uh, plan to stay in, young people can plan to stay in or move to for opportunities and growth. And, you know, we're not just talking about one additional company. I think there's kind of a tipping point that tends to happen when you get a lot of, uh, tech experience in the city and with Amazon and, and now potentially Oracle and all the healthcare tech related jobs, et cetera, in the city. I think there's really potential for Nashville to turn into, you know, one of the kind of tier one technology cities of the country with uh, a lot of other young people like myself leaving these coastal, you know, areas and high tax areas that are being uh, mismanaged and, moving into you know cities like austin denver and uh, nashville so definitely challenges but to me this is a really exciting opportunity if managed correctly to turn nashville into really uh, an amazing city you know for the next 20 years um so and beyond so anyways that's uh, really my comments thank you and uh have a good rest of the day thank you and good luck to your move with your move you already sound like a native nashvillian Next caller. The next caller. Thank you. You're recognized for three minutes. Just introduce yourself first, please. Hey there. My name is Ann Barnett. I'm calling from 618 Larchwood Drive out here in Donaldson. 
Um, and I am a member of Stand Up Nashville, and we have been working really hard over the past six months on a bill that uh, passed unanimously at, in second reading in the last Metro Council meeting, uh, the Get It Right Bill, which attempts to raise the standards for uh, how Metro spends its money on construction. And so I am calling to ask whether or not Oracle will voluntarily commit to following the state safety standards, the commitments to transparency and subcontracting, and the utilization of Department of Labor registered apprenticeship programs um, that this uh, get it right bill, uh, the standards that it is placing for Metro contracts. Um, I also wonder if they will uh, commit to using a first source hiring system, a first source hiring program, such as was committed to by National Soccer Holdings for the um, development at the fairgrounds. So because we have so many uh, questions and we need so many more commitments from Oracle, I'm encouraging that this be deferred until we can have a bigger conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Barnett. Next caller. You are ready for three minutes. Just introduce yourself first, please. Thanks so much. My name is Melissa Cherry. I'm a native Nashvilleian. I live at 3211 Moorwood Drive and 37207 along the Dickerson Road corridor. Um, I grew up in East Nashville, and I've seen the way that our city comes together after disaster after disaster. I don't think that our city should have to recover from a development deal that we walk into voluntarily. I've watched friends and family that grew up with me in East Nashville be displaced from neighborhood to neighborhood and now into outlying areas where they have even less tenant protections than we enjoy here in Nashville. I know that there are tons of homeowners, myself included, who will benefit in the long run from a higher property value. I also know that to be part of a community, we have to be thinking about the entire community and how it impacts the people that have rented here who have no path to home ownership currently. With the average rate wage of a renter in this city being $40,000 a year and the average home price being $350,000, that's already, that's already a situation that displaces every single person that has a desire to work in an industry that supports a tourist city and wants to own a home. This development might increase property value. It will absolutely increase housing insecurity. There's already displacement along the Dickerson Road corridor. We're hearing about it already, businesses and renters alike. We've had no opportunity to hear from those people. I've watched mayors wring their hands about affordable housing for 25 years and have the lack of political will to do anything other than fund developers to base affordable housing on in incomes of $70,000 and more. It's time that we have the political will to have the conversation about how we keep the people that make Nashville run in Nashville. Unless and until we have the courage to have that conversation in a truthful way, there will be no sign on from native Nashvilleans in developments that will bring more and more people with higher incomes to this city. Wealth inequality is at its worst already. The income of a homeowner in this city is twice that of a renter. That will not change in a positive way with the de Oracle development on the East Bank. Thank you for your time. Defer this vote. Thank you very much. Next caller, Shirley. Say my name. Yes, caller, go ahead. 
Hi, my name is Zoe, and I live in 501 Fifth Avenue South. And I just wanted to call in and just talk about how great of an opportunity I think Oracle would be moving to Nashville. And I'm just really excited as living in Nashville just because of how many other cities would have wanted this opportunity. And um, I really believe that Oracle's presence will transform the East Bank area. And I know there are a lot of like comments on the lack of transparency. And as a Nashville resident, I, I don't share that view. This investment is just a part of the larger River North development, which has been in the works for about the last two years now. And elements of that project have come before the council dozens of times. And in my view, this is just like the first initial step. As we continue to move through that process, you know, Oracle will have to go through the same planning and zoning and permitting process. And I feel like those will all have opportunities for public input. And as a city, you know, we have to ask ourselves, do we want this like tech company to invest a billion dollars in our community? And I think it's a no brainer. But um, yeah, so I just wanted to hop in and share that information and how I was feeling about the situation. Thanks for your comment. Next caller. Thank you. Next caller, you're recognized. Just give us your name, and you're recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this is Councilman Member Nigel Pastora. Yes, go ahead. Thank you. I'm calling to. Uh, I was listening in, and I know that Council Member Pastora started talking about my amendment. I wanted to at least provide some clarification on that. But more than anything, I wanted to say that I do appreciate some of the pushbacks that come. I, I understand them, uh, but I don't want us to look at that and not look at the other opportunities that these uh, contracts does provide. Uh, one of the one of my concerns when I heard about the deal was affordable housing, which is one of the reasons why I'm making the proposal to IMAC or for the council to allow us to use 50 percent of the taxes uh, towards affordable housing. I think this is an opportunity for us to have a dedicated funding, something that we've not had uh, for affordable housing over the past couple of years and something that a lot of people are asking for. The issue of affordable housing naturally is here before Oracle and it's something that we have to keep thinking of ways to solve. Uh, these allow us to be able to do that and have a dedicated funding. I also wanted to say that while I hear all the concerns and they're all legitimate, um, the issue that we face doesn't have to be either or. Uh, it doesn't have to be just affordable housing. We can also have jobs. And so I believe this contract allows us to be able to provide high end jobs for our uh, residents. It allows us to be able to have a pipeline for our kids to have uh, education into STEM that I think overall is going to be good for all of us. The other thing that it does also is that the infrastructure development uh, on this deal. This is an infrastructure development that we need as a city, but that we cannot afford to pay for up front. And so uh, I wanted to say that we need to keep continue talking and making things better, uh, but if forward is to look at how to make it work for us. Uh, growth is not easy, but it's needed, but we need smart growth. This is one that allows us to do that, allow us to put money in affordable housing, allow us to look at those jobs. Uh, uh, and I want to tell everyone that is concerned that uh, we on the council, I as a representative, I'm concerned. That's why I raised affordable housing and the other issues that I raised, we will continue to find from them. And I hope that Oracle will be part of that solution uh, as we move forward. So thank you all uh, for allowing me to speak and uh, for everyone's uh, concern uh, for the better Nashville. Thank you. Thank you, council lady. Next caller. Here, I think the council lady was the last one. Okay, so I move to close the public hearing. I second that. Thank you. Margaret, do I need a vote on that or is that, is it closed? I, I, I do not think that you need to, can you hear me? I, I do not think, okay, I don't think that you need to move to close the hearing. You can just close the hearing. Okay, it's Sorry closed. To interrupt, but we did, we did just get one more. Do you want to take that call? 
Oh. <laughs> Margaret, let me ask you this. Since I just said, is it closed? I'm not a lawyer. Uh, give me some legal advice here, my friend. Uh, I honestly, I'm going to leave that up to you. They were <laughs> calling okay. in right at the close. I hate to cut. I, I hate to not hear, you know, okay. the voices from the public. Yeah, the caller through. Take one more call. Let's go ahead and put the caller through. Okay, give us one second. Thank you, caller. You recognize, identify yourself, and you have three minutes. Here you have the last caller. Thank you. Identify yourself and you have three minutes. Oh, yes. My name is Aaron Wilson. Uh, my address is 1760 Florida Drive. And I'm demanding a deferral on Oracle. Uh, we need more time to access what the city is going to be. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you very much. Short and sweet. Okay. Now I close the public hearing. And let me, let me just say on behalf of everybody involved today, one, uh, Chardet, you're a rock star. I think if you ever want to uh, work on a radio program, you probably have a second career is a, operating the call-in line for song requests. Um, to the citizenry that called in and, and to the external audience, this is why I made Nashville my home is because today is a real testament of how much we love our city. And I, I, no matter what happens today, I wanna be clear that um, the fact that so many Nashvillians from all across this county call in and want to be part of this process, that care about the growth of our community and what type of city we're gonna be is uh, always heartwarming to me. And I'm always surprised by the intelligence, the intellect, um, the caring and the heart that our citizenry has. So just as chair, point of personal privilege, I just wanna say I'm grateful um, for those of you who are not from Nashville and uh, our Oracle friends and other companies that have agenda items later on the agenda. Thank you for your patience. And I hope that you see just how special this community is is it is so much better to have people care about the city they live in than to have them drive in, go home and turn out the lights. And we're a city on, our, on the move and that's, that's what's driving all of this discussion. So um, thanks for sort of your liberty and allowing me to have a, just a second of a soapbox. Um, I think for efficiency sake, what I would like to do is to move the, have a motion to move old business to the heel of the agenda. So basically we can continue on with Oracle and take a vote on that. I think it'll just be a smoother process. So um, does it, will anyone make that motion? I'll, I'll make that motion. Okay. I second. Okay, thank you. Um, any discussion on the motion? All right, we will take a roll call vote on the motion. Uh, Nigel Hodge. Agree. Ken Weaver. Aye. Aye. Christina Allen. Agree. Quinn Siegel. Aye. Tequila Johnson. Aye. Sarah Hanna. Aye. Winnie Forrester. Aye. Anthony Davis. Aye. And Ginger Hauser, aye. And thank you all members for hanging with us and still being on the line. Um, so we're gonna flip down, if you're looking at your agenda, and we're gonna flip down to old business. Hopefully I'm doing this right. Margaret. Um, so now- New business. I'm sorry, I moved old business to the heel. I'm confusing myself. Um, so we are, if you're looking at the agenda, we're at item five, new business, item A. We're considering the resolution regarding the economic impact plan 
for the River North Infrastructure Economic Development Area, among other things. And we have several folks from Oracle that are on the call. Mr. Jim Murphy is an, a local attorney, um, formerly with Metro Legal at one point in his life. Um, Jim, why don't you introduce the Oracle team? And then I believe we have a presentation from Oracle on their project and also just a little bit about them as a corporate um, partner and citizen. Sure. Thanks, Ginger. We've got a large group of folks here primarily to answer questions if they come up. Uh, the, uh, but the folks here include Jennifer Burke, who is a, a executive vice president, uh, Brian Higgins, who's in the general counsel's office, uh, Marissa Kachigian, who is in the uh, government relations office. Uh, let's see, Colleen Cassidy, who's in their um, community uh, uh, the volunteer program for the community. Uh, I think Tracy Wade is here. She's with the uh, group that works with the uh, uh, Education Foundation. Um, Denise Hobbs is here. She's also on the uh, education side. Um, Don uh, Watson here is, is on the real estate. Mark Williams is on the real estate person. Uh, I think that might be everybody here that's from Oracle. Tom Trent, my partner, is also here. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to Marissa and Jennifer. Marissa is going to run the slides and Jennifer is going to make the presentation. So Jennifer, you and Marissa are up. Great. Thank you so much. And thank you, Chair Hauser. And thank you to Mayor Cooper, Commissioner Rolf, the Industrial Development Board members, and the general public for taking the time to be here today. It's an honor to be with you today in Nashville, albeit virtually, to discuss this exciting opportunity. As mentioned before, I'm Jennifer Burke. I'm the Executive Vice President of Operations here at Oracle. Welcome. So let's start with uh, helping you get to know Oracle a little bit more. We were founded in 1977 by Larry Ellison, a man who was raised by his aunt and never graduated college. He saw something that others said couldn't be done, which was the creation of a relational database. And despite the fact that there was many people said that this wasn't possible, he went off to do it and was quite successful. I've had the opportunity to hear Larry tell his story. And although he has a very big public persona, many of you may have experienced, hearing the story directly from him is endearing and amazing. His vision for Oracle when he started it was to have a company with 40 employees. He thought that would make his adoptive mother, his aunt, proud. He, was, he came from the Midwest, and as he describes it, his family was always disappointed in him that he didn't become a doctor or a lawyer. As somebody who was raised by a Midwestern family herself, I can, I can feel that sentiment um, and a disappointment in my father and myself for not going that path. But Larry obviously far surpassed his vision for this company. Currently, we have over 135,000 employees across the globe. In the past fiscal, our revenue was over $39 billion. And today we serve over 430,000 customers across 175 countries. Now we're lucky enough to still have Larry Ellison, our founder, working here at Oracle as our chief technology officer and our chairman. With that, the core focus of Oracle continues to be on innovation and solving the world's problems. Today, we have over 38,000 employees focused on development and engineering, building the solutions of the future. And we've spent over 70 billion in research and development since 2004. So what do we do? Many of you may not even know what a relational database is. Um, Oracle is the only technology company with both a scaled global cloud infrastructure platform and a full suite of modern cloud applications. Now, while that may or may not mean anything to you, I know I try and describe this to my own father many times, and he has a hard time grasping what I mean by that. Maybe we can talk a little bit about how you might interact with Oracle's technology every day. Had I had the opportunity to fly to see you in person today, Oracle's technology would have helped enable me to book a flight and get on an airplane to come see you. It would have helped support the Lyft driver who picked me up at the airport and took me to my hotel. It 
perhaps would have powered the reservation system of the hotel where I stayed at. And it might have even enabled the local coffee shop where I got my coffee in the morning to support both their uh, bill, their billing of their customers and their uh, inventory, et cetera. So each of us interact with Oracle's technology every day. Despite the fact that I wasn't able to come see you in person today, Oracle's technology is still working for us, helping to power companies like Cisco WebEx and the web conference that we're using today. So while you may not have known that you interacted with Oracle's technology previously, each of us interact with it each and every day, and it's working hard behind the scenes to make our lives easier to support both small and large businesses to succeed and build their future. So if you'll indulge me, I won't read to you every word on every slide, but I would like to read this one. Safra Katz is our CEO, and she really sets the culture of Oracle. And this is a quote by Safra, and I'll read it to you now. Every good idea at Oracle comes from our employees. By building diverse and inclusive teams, we benefit from each other's strengths and perspectives. That's what turns good ideas into great ideas. And I think this is a really important quote quote, because it does help identify the culture at Oracle. We are a people first company, whether that be our employees, our customers, or the communities in which we work. And Safra really sets that tone from the top. Oracle is a great place to work. Um, I personally will celebrate my 19th anniversary at Oracle this coming Sunday. I hope not to be working this coming Sunday, but nonetheless, I can celebrate my 19th year at Oracle. And we're consistently recognized as an employer of choice. And we're proud of our commitment to a diverse and inclusive culture. On this slide, you'll see many of the awards we've won over the years. I'll add to this a recent one that didn't quite make the slide, but in 2021, Fortune has named us as one of the best companies to work for in diversity and inclusion. And again, we're very proud of that and all the hard work that goes into these awards. All right, let's talk a little bit about Oracle in the community, as I know many have, have raised this as uh, a concern today. We are very focused on work in the community. We're focused on giving. Oracle in the last year gave 22 million to support over 6,000 nonprofits across the world. One of those is my son's local school, for which I'm very grateful to Oracle that when I donate to our local public school, I can go to Oracle and ask for a matching donation. And it's something that they'll give to me each year. Another is volunteering. We have over 36,000 Oracle volunteers who donated over 132,000 hours in their local communities. I heard somebody in the initial public forum mention the Second Harvest Food Bank. This is a charity that's very near and dear to me. In my second year at Oracle, I started a team building event where we went every usually the week or two before Thanksgiving to volunteer our time at the local Second Harvest Food Bank. This year would have been our 17th year of that same team building event. I even spent three years working over in Europe, and my team was so focused on this event that they continued the event even when I wasn't here. When we couldn't service our local food bank this year because it was closed and they weren't accepting volunteers, I put a call out to my team to say, you know, let's not let this year go by without doing something, particularly given all of the food security that was going on during the pandemic. And the response was overwhelming. Hearing from the team on how they found a way to contribute locally, whether it was their local church, a local community center, or donating money to places like Second Harvest. The team was very excited, although we couldn't be in person, to continue that tradition. I share this with you to let you know these words are not just words on slides to try and portray things that Oracle would like to do. This is how our workforce commits to our local community. And it's something they want to do as being part of it. We're also very focused on sustainability. And whether that's the stat on renewable energy that we highlight here, or cleaning up our local greenways and waterways, it's a commitment that Oracle has to the future of, frankly, the, the earth. All right, community engagement is in Oracle's DNA, and it is through programs like Oracle Diversity and Inclusion, Oracle Education Foundation, 
and the Oracle Academy that we are both intentional and thoughtful about the value we bring to communi communities in which we operate. I know there's a lot of words on this slide and, and many of you may not have time to read all of them right now, but this is also included in many of the FAQs that Oracle's put out previously. So feel free if you're not able to get through all of this to go back and read those slide, that FAQ as well. All right, why Nashville? At the center of Oracle, considering building a campus in Nashville is really the access to the world-class higher education institutions and talented workforce. The campus that we're looking to build would be heavily built by college graduates. And our first priority would be to obtain those college graduates from your local universities or potentially from folks that grew up in and around Nashville who might have gone to university elsewhere. <laughs> Another area that we're very attracted to as, as it relates to Nashville is a diverse population and vibrant culture. We really believe that's what attracts our employees to grow roots, to build a foundation in the community and to give back to the community in which they, in which they live and operate. We, we love the proximity to the waterfront and the downtown walkability. If you were to see many of Oracle's hubs around the United States, most of them are somehow centered around water. This again goes back to our founder, Larry Olson, who's very focused on this. And we love that it's a destination of choice for new employees. It's a city people want to live in and they love to live in. And that's very attractive to us. All right, let's talk a little bit about the project. So many of you have read some of this in the news reports and whatnot. We would look to start uh, and ramp to about 2,500 jobs by 2027. As I mentioned, many of those would be hired directly from the college campus, and we would grow to approximately 8,500 by the end of 2031. At that size, we would be having a, a payroll, annual payroll of roughly a billion to support this workflow force and really sort of feeding tax dollars into your local community. We estimate that this project would create an additional 11,500 ancillary jobs that would be ongoing in the community, in addition to an incremental 10,000 jobs that would be created during the construction period. The construction overall would cost Oracle a capital investment of about 1.2 billion. What would this bring to the local Nashville community? The anticipated local fiscal impacts include 8.8 .8 million in local sales tax annually that go directly to the local community and an incremental 16.1 in local sales tax generated during the construction period. Now let's look, many of you know the River North site, but for some of you, this may be your first time to see it in this slide. So you can see on the left where it is on the map, and then we've got an aerial view of what the site looks like today where Oracle would consider building their campus. This next view, if Marissa will put it up, I think is just a stunning view. Um, if anyone were to see the campus that we recently built in Austin, this is almost a mirror image. You can see the River North side on the lower left of this slide overlooking the gorgeous uh, downtown skyline of Nashville. Um, it's almost a mirror image of, of the campus that we built in Austin. So we're very excited about the prospect of that. It's a, a beautiful view in a beautiful city. All right, uh, many of you will be interested to see this. This is a draft conceptual design of what our campus would look like. I, what, what I wanna highlight to you here is something that's again, very important to Larry personally. He wants it to feel like a campus, very focused on a lot of green space and waterways. He doesn't, he, Oracle's culture is not to have a high density campus full of sky rises, et cetera. It's really focused on a campus like environment where employees can both be in their offices and have green space outdoors to work and live, as well as invite the, commun the local community into those green spaces as well. You can see we envision um, having a, a access to the waterway and uh, bringing some, some life and some restaurants and activities that could happen right there on the waterway. We're very, as I mentioned earlier, attracted to the waterway, the river. All right, so this I think is, is a focus that many of you will be interested in. What is the public infrastructure that Oracle's offering to fund? Again, this is an aerial view of the campus, of the 
potential drawing of the campus. You can see the waterway that still comes in the campus in the green space. What I'd like you to focus on first is, is the greenway across the riverfront. Um, you know, that, that is something Oracle would fund is the riverfront greenway with public asset access as well as a park. Um, you can see the potential ped pedestrian bridge that would connect this site to Germantown and, and allow many of our employees who we think might live in Germantown or elsewhere locally to be able to walk to campus and not necessarily need their car to drive. Additionally, we would be funding roads and public utilities, including stormwater management and some potential remediation of the landfill that had previously been on this site. All right, let's talk a little bit more about the public infrastructure proposal. So Oracle would pay upfront for up to 175 million for public infrastructure improvements that would be agreed between Metro and Oracle. Oracle doesn't have unilateral rights to make the decision on what gets invested in. It is a joint decision with Metro. The Metro IDB would reimburse Oracle for the actual public infrastructure costs with 50% of the real property taxes generated from the project. Metro would retain the remaining 50%. And as Mayor Cooper had, has mentioned, much of that would be invested for um, both affordable housing and, and public schools, et cetera. The reimbursement would end after 25 annual payments or a maximum repayment of 175 million, whichever came first. And after that, Metro would retain all site taxes following the reimbursement. What, are, what do we think uh, the benefits to Metro are? First and foremost, it doesn't use any current city funds. It doesn't require Metro to issue bonds or pay any interest. Oracle would fund all the infrastructure up front and get paid back over time as and when the taxes were generated. No risk to the city. It's a performance-based approach. If Oracle doesn't spend the money, Metro does not reimburse Oracle. And finally, um, you know, Oracle's paying for the public infrastructure up front and gets reimbursed over time. This, oh yeah. With this, I'd like to turn it over to Commissioner Rolf, who I think believe wants to say a few more words uh, from the perspective of the state. Commissioner Rolf. Very good. Thank you. And uh, I hope uh, this will be very brief. Um, would just like to say from the state's perspective, certainly the importance of this project. I think what is maybe unique that I'm discovering that maybe I didn't discover before this public hearing is we recruited about 500 projects across the state. And candidly, I've not experienced um, perhaps the kind of resistance, and I'm not arguing whether it's right or wrong. It's just that in the other 500 projects, the communities have invited the companies that we have brought to the state uh, to be uh, part of that campus, part of that community, and hopefully a great partnership. Um, personally, uh, we did recruit a couple of great uh, uh, global brands to, to Nashville, Alliance Bernstein being one of them, and uh, our friends at Amazon being another one. And most of the cases when these large projects come to these cities, uh, these companies are renters, meaning they don't own the real estate, they simply enter into 10, 15 year leases to rent space. What separates Oracle is Oracle is investing $1.4 billion of their own capital. You're gonna say, well, why is that important? Well, they can't just pick up and move that capital if for whatever reason, they're either in a downsizing or they decide to change their business model, et cetera. So I can just tell you that this is perhaps a unique and most transformational uh, project. When it comes to infrastructure, candidly, every community, that's what communities do. They provide infrastructure to the citizens and the companies and the jobs being created. And in this case, I applaud or Oracle for being so creative and putting the money up front and then asking to be reimbursed over a 25 year period. Lastly, I can just simply say the 8,500 Oracle jobs over 10 years on top of the 11,700 new jobs 
that will be created as an indirect uh, opportunity to support the company's operations will combine that's over 20,000 jobs over the next 10 years. Construction alone, 21,000 jobs, 10,000 direct and 11,000 indirect. And I know they are temporary, but they're gonna be construction jobs over the next uh, 10 years. The chamber has historically cited the statistics, 80 new people are moving to Nashville every day. So if you just simply do the math, that's about 29,000 people moving to Nashville a year and over 10 years, about 290,000 people. Oracle is simply planning to invest and ultimately hire 8,500 people. And if you did the math, it's about 850 jobs a year. I would just simply say that uh, while there are an enormous set of challenges that I've come to appreciate today, I want us to make sure that we're thoughtful that it's not Oracle's responsibility to figure out and solve every problem for our city. And I can just say for the last two years, I've gotten to know this company very, very well, from the CEO to everybody on this uh, call from the Oracle team. And I stand behind, we have tried to create, to recruit, not only one of the greatest global brands, but a great company. So with that, I will uh, step aside and uh, yield to the chair. So uh, I think you, so chair, that concludes our presentation. So we're ready for uh, questions or comments from members of the board. My name is Ken Weaver. I'm on the industrial development board and I want to make sure I understand the math. I heard the 50 50 sharing up to $175 million um, total reimbursement. And I think would that imply to me that over that 25 year period, you know, I did the math with $18 million times 25 years is $450 million. But if I said um, at $175 million at 50-50 share, the city of Nashville could reasonably expect to get the other $175 million in additional property tax revenue from this project. Am I doing the math correctly? Um, I'll, I'll try to respond to that. Um, the, the $18 million number is, 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 is at the point of full build out. Okay. So that's an average number over the 25 year period. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, the first few years, that number is significantly less because sure. the buildings are not in place. But the, the 18 million is an average for the life of the 25 year period. Um, it's it's kind of what where we are at this point. Or it's at least, it's at least when build out occurs, we'll, we'll be generating 18 million. So half of that 9 million will go to Metro and under the mayor's proposal or, or council members far as proposal, half of that would be used for affordable housing. So that's kind of how the numbers are generated. Perfect. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. I appreciate that. And may, and may I add that a personal property tax is not included Yes, right. sir. So the city retains all of that and all of the sales tax. And these numbers don't take into account inflation over the 25 year period. So it's very possible that this $175 million number will be a cop earlier, in which event the city gets it back earlier. Uh, thank you. Other questions? Chair, can, can we just jump in as members and, and ask, or are you, are you just kind of going through any order? Or? Yeah, great question, Anthony. Chair Hauser, yeah, my recommendation would be Chair Hauser, just because we can't see everybody, that maybe we go in order uh, and give each board member time to ask questions and make comments. I feel like we can't hear the no, chair. You're muted. She's, she's muted. Shoot, sorry. 
happens at some point in every meeting. Right? Anthony, why don't, uh, I like Nigel's suggestion. So, Anthony, why don't we let you go next? Okay, fair enough. Um, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you to, uh, for the presentation. And if any of the callers are still around, I wanted to thank all the caller input and the mayor as well for putting this forward. Um, I, I had several kind of comments and questions and just things I wanted to talk through. Um, you know, as, as the IDB, of course, we're the first uh, to vet this project. And then um, uh, with council support, of course, we would send it up to council and for further input. Um, to me, the foundation of the deal sounds really rare and like a great deal. I'll say that out right out of the gate. Um, I've done a lot of these ECD deals from council um, and Oracle fronting the funding and then the 50% TIF payback is, is pretty unheard of for these larger deals. So um, I will just put that out there. Recently, someone sent me a North Carolina deal. I think it was Apple or something that recently took place that was an astronomical amount of money and, and just a lot of things thrown at that. So, um, you know, interest-free capital to build uh, our infrastructures, a uh, very good thing. Uh, I've also been a fan of the corporate citizen things I've heard of with Oracle. Um, I'm very interested in the partnership uh, with MNPS. I guess that would be my first question. Um, I used to represent the Stratford District. That's our STEM high school. Uh, and our STEM cluster is, uh, if you could just comment on is that a plan to be a pipeline with sort of a STEM feeder uh, that would maybe lead to future jobs? That's kind of what I've heard out there in the ether, but I'd like to get your comments on how you would partner with our school district. Colleen, do you want to take that one? Are you muted? I, I was muted. I can kick off and then I think Denise will have things to add as well. Perfect. So, hello, everyone. My name is Colleen Cassidy. I'm the Vice President of Corporate Citizenship Oracle and the Executive Director of the Oracle Education Foundation. And there are a couple of ways um, that we would partner with schools, one of which is through the aforementioned Oracle Volunteering Program that Jennifer described. So just to give you a sense of how this fits into our culture and how committed we are to volunteerism in the communities so, and work. Yeah. We are this year celebrating the 30th anniversary of the Oracle Volunteering Program. So the statistics that Jennifer shared, that's one year worth of commitment. This is a, a mainstay of our culture. And unlike some companies that <laughs> sort of volunteer their employees to volunteer. Our volunteerism is genuine. It is grassroots. The vast, vast majority of Oracle volunteering projects, by which I mean probably upwards of 99% of Oracle volunteering projects, are initiated by our employees with their favorite schools, their favorite nonprofit organizations. And one of the things that we see consistently around the world is Oracle employees getting involved with their children's schools, getting involved with the schools that they attended for elementary, middle and secondary school. I myself do that. So we would expect a really robust and energetic Oracle volunteering presence in schools. Our employees also give um, to schools, and as Jennifer mentioned, the company matches their donations. The Oracle Education Foundation would also provide a dimension of engagement. So that's a nonprofit organization funded by Oracle, um, which I manage along with a program team. Safra Katz, Oracle CEO, is the chair of the board of directors of the foundation. It's been for a long time. And while our broader philanthropy and corporate citizenship efforts encompass advancing education, protecting the environment, and strengthening communities, education is in many ways the first among equals in terms of our commitment. Through the foundation, we provide a variety of classes at the intersection of coding, physical computing, which is to say electronics and hardware, design thinking, which is an approach to problem solving based in empathy that involves prototyping and iteration 
it may or may not be a familiar term. Increasingly, as, as we move into the next 10 years of the foundation's activities, we're combining design thinking with futures thinking. Futures thinking is the notion that foresight is a skill and you can learn it. And so teaching people not only how to become really effective designers of solutions to people's needs and the world's problems, but also equipping them with the capacity to imagine and envision a future and then have agency in terms of creating that best possible future for themselves and for all of us and for this planet. So we engage through the foundations program at high school level. We have a team of very skilled educators who are also maker technologists and design thinkers and are becoming futurists who comprise the foundations program team. They develop curriculum and deliver classes. We engage Oracle volunteers in helping the program staff to coach those classes for high school students. Um, here in California at the Redwood Shores Oracle campus in Northern California, we work with Design Tech High School, which happens to be our kith and kin and neighbor. The DTech is the nickname of the school. And we actually built it a home on our corporate campus. Um, so we work with Design Tech High School. We also work with a, wonders, a wonderful school called Eastside College Prep in East Palo Alto. That is a, an adjacent community in Northern California that has historically been very economically challenged. And the school that we work with there is 99% first generation college bound um, students of color. In Austin, Texas, we've expanded the foundations program and there we're in the second year of a very successful partnership with the Ann Richards School for Young Women Leaders. It would be a natural thing for us to do in Nashville as well, is to um, identify a wonderful school to start working with and expand over time. And one of the benefits beyond the skills that students learn in our classes is they also start to develop a wonderful network of adult professional relationships. So some of the students who participated for a few years now in this class, I look at their LinkedIn profile, they have hundreds of connections that are mostly adults in industry, as well as the people in their social circle and educators. So it's a, an incredible start for a young person in terms of thinking about their future and their career. And with that, I'll turn it over to Denise. Thanks, Thanks, Colleen. Um, I'm Denise Hobbs, and thank you for the opportunity to be here with all of you. Oracle Academy is Oracle's global philanthropic education program. So our mission is to simply advance computing education by providing classroom resources to high schools of so secondary as well as post-secondary. Now the resources fall in several different kinds of buckets from curriculum to educator professional development, to cloud technologies, to software, to certification resources. From specifically from a high school perspective, our curriculum and um, resources typically fall in either a computer science pathway or career technical education uh, because our curriculum is a path of a progression of uh, courses that actually can lead to certification as well. Um, from your, in terms of your question, Anthony, about um, building a pipeline. So Oracle Academy most certainly works from a secondary level and then also into a post-secondary level. So two and four year universities are oftentimes utilizing the same exact resources in their academic content courses as well. Uh, so I think there is that opportunity at a high level to think holistically about how to build that pipeline from secondary into post-secondary and then into career so that students are in fact building those industry relevant skills um, that you know opens doors to careers across multiple industries does that help and is there anything else i can answer yeah, no, I appreciate all that info, and um, I know you guys tie into HBCUs, and um, I was mainly thinking about the the 
high schools and school districts. Um, again, Stratford, I definitely put out there in advance as one to connect with uh, on your list. And um, the academy program at Metro Nashville Public Schools should uh, it sounds like it would be a good tie-in with kind of the way you structure these uh, programs. Um, I'll keep going, just kind of want to occupy all the all the space from the other board members here. But uh, I know it's a different kind of question. Um, I know this is going to come up to council, and keep in mind, I'm just asking things that are going to come up again. So this can be like a rehearsal. <laughs> uh, the the parks on the on the plan. I know that there's going to be some open space on the campus and the whole public aspect. Um, I've, I've heard this from several council members, friends of mine, and just I know as people, it's out there in the public. Um, we, if there is any open space, would you guys preserve it as public? We, I think the general buzz of the community is we don't want another ascend amphitheater situation where it's like this beautiful piece of the park that nobody can walk through. You know, that's, I feel like, um, you know, that's something that I think people would like a commitment on early that if there is open space, it's going to be accessible by the public. Yeah, I'm, I'm, it's, it's Brian Higgins. I'm not sure who the best person to, to answer that one is, uh, Mr. Davis, but I think I think the answer is probably yes. I mean, our current campus in Redwood Shores, open to the public. There's a huge lake that people walk around. You know, it's accessible to anyone. So I wouldn't envision that being the same case in um, in Nashville. And I think it's also the case in Austin. So uh, I suspect that it would be a positive answer. Yeah, hey, Brian, okay. this is Don Watson. You are correct that we that is the same case also in Austin, where it's an open campus for where the public walking spaces are and everything like that. Awesome. That that would be fantastic. Yeah, we we all feel a little burned by a sand amphitheater. That's the reason I forgot to throw them under a bus, but that's why I throw that one out there. Uh, just wasn't kind of what we expected. Um, uh, another question is uh, MTA and transit. Um, is there a way, you know, I'm sure you guys are thinking about that, especially with your sustainability efforts seem really great. Um, will, you know, the Easy Ride program is a program you guys could join where sort of the passes to WeGo are subsidized um, to, to get, you know, maybe less parking needed. And and you seem like the kind of company that would do stuff like that. I just didn't know if you looked into it yet. And is that something that you could tie in with MTA and WeGo and uh, do the, uh, potentially do the uh, Easy Ride program for your employees? Yes. Yeah, honestly, has, has, yeah, sorry, I was going to say it has not been looked into, but I suspect that it's definitely something that we consider. I don't, sorry, Don, if I, I jumped in too soon, but um, no, yeah, no, definitely. You're good, Brian. I, yeah, no, that's fine. Uh, from a sustainability perspective, yeah, we would absolutely be looking at, you know, this option and, uh, and, and you know, talking about other potential options that, that might exist there also. So. Um, you know, I think absolutely as we think about this campus and um, the sustainability of it, um, you know, transportation obviously is is a big part of that discussion. Okay, great. Um, I know you could you could work with the mayor's office of sustainability, of course, directly with WeGo Transit. Um, I know you will be visiting all the stakeholders. I'm sure again, this stuff will come up at council too. So just things that you know, while we're in this process, you could maybe be meeting with stakeholders and stuff i think uh would be awesome and we'll all be you know excited about this and everything I'm not trying to beat anybody up with these questions just kind of like putting stuff out there that i know you know as we're the sort of initial vetting and and then it goes to council uh the big stuff i wanted to you know ask just a couple more questions on um is the construction um some of you may know i, I did a, a ordinance called the do better bill and uh you know when we do these ecd deals um, you're bringing a lot of great jobs. There's no question about that. Those construction jobs are the temporary ones. And so part of what we're trying to do in Nashville, and, and you probably had the same thing in Austin, where we're, we're trying to create really good career jobs for workers that are safe and good career jobs. Um, I, the first question I was asked, you know, you've got the infrastructure and site prep. Do you know uh, which parts will be maybe done as a participation agreement um, with you guys in Creek Lane or um, awarding the contracts? Is that something you've looked at as far as like what percentage or which portions of this might be done in a participation agreement on the construction end hey, Anthony sorry I was muted uh, that's Jim Murphy uh, we're not sure yet because we're still early in the planning stage the one Eric the one project that we think we might be doing a participation agreement with is the bridge just because right. of the logistics of building a bridge over the river 
where in the participation agreement, Metro would build the bridge and we would fund it. That's the, that's the concept we've discussed preliminarily with Metro, but we're not sure about that yet. As far as the other infrastructure, it's still early to tell, but we're gonna look at that kind of strategically with Metro, which pieces work best with Metro doing them and us funding them, and which pieces work best with us funding them and doing the work. So those are still to be determined, but we're, so as we go through the planning process, that will start to sort out better, I think, as we identify which infrastructure pieces can be better handled by Metro versus those that will be best handled by us. Gotcha. Um, and I know, you know, you heard among the many callers, there was uh, one that really stood out was they were talking about that get it right bill that we passed recently. And, um, you know, it's I had started on procurement work when I was still on council, and then they've continued it now with a really great ordinance. Um, that that would ensure so the bridge would obviously be one of those because it's it's a waterway and you're going to work with Metro on that. That would ensure those those really good jobs, the safety uh, protocols and and that sort of thing. Um, I you know I know there was some interest. You don't know yet about the remediation part. I, I got that from y'all's presentation. It could be 30 million. I think the mayor said like 100 million. We just don't know. Um, but you know there's right next door. Um, the river north, I guess the current the site that's next to this, um, there was a labor agreement, Lyuna's working on it, um, and it was performed by participation agreements. Um, they're good union jobs, strong safety standards. Um, and I just wonder if y'all will at least take a look at with the remediation portion. Um, I mean, because it kind of, you know, and, and again, it's maybe the same in Austin with what you're doing, but you know, you've got these folks working right there. It's kind of what we're trying to do. It's like you'd be moving them over to the sort of the next job. And that's kind of with these labor jobs, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to keep these careers going for people where we know they have good standards and high road contractors, they're, they're good wages, you know. Um, and I, I've always, from the government spending side, been I'd pay a little more just to, you know, ensure that the jobs of these taxpayers that are living houses that are paying property taxes, they're going to have better jobs. So. Um, that's just something I'll ask if you consider that, you know, as you're doing the, uh, and hopefully, you know, would you meet with stand up, meet with Layuna, those kind of stakeholders throughout this process and just, just visit with them and see if that those agreements could be something we'd work on. I don't know if you want to comment, Jim, or. I think this is Don's comment. Is it Don? He's yeah, yeah, I, I mean, look. Yeah, I mean, I absolutely. I have no no issues in, in meeting with key stakeholders and having different discussions. I think, you know, if, if I think about Oracle's just overall process for these jobs, you know, we're, we're going to welcome all qualified vendors to really take a look at these jobs as we as we go out to work on them. And we're going to look at a variety of factors from safety performance to past project experiences to how they focus in on the environment and sustainability. Um, you know, cost is going to be a piece of that, but then also the experience of the workforce and team that's going to be coming to the table to do this work. I mean, I, we absolutely recognize that there's going to be complexities as, as we build out this campus. Um, and, you know, the, the quality and the experience of the workforce that, that, we, that comes to really work on these is going to be a, a critical component of what we're doing. Awesome. Um, well, I just Definitely put in a good word for that since these guys are working next door. And uh, I think I cut them off. Is that Tom Trent? Excuse me. Yeah, that's fine. Go ahead. Say that again? I didn't mean to interrupt you. Please continue. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Um, no, that's that was, I was just kind of bringing that point to a head. Um, I know that's going to come up more at council. Um, and you know, I'm again, I'm putting these things out here early. I think I kind of, kind of consider that our role here at the IDB again to vet the, to vet the deal overall, but also just sort of the pulse of Nashville. What you know, you heard all the phone calls. Um, I'm not necessarily in favor of a deferral today. I, you know, I plan to push this forward and, and I've, I've, I've asked the questions now I want to ask and, um, and I uh, hopefully have put some things to think about as you go to council um what what the concerns are what the pulse is in nashville we are thinking about those workers construction workers but uh you know we know your jobs are really good jobs it's, it's the construction jobs that just always get forgotten about in these situations um but other than that the parks you know the, the metro school tie-in um and again very it seems like a very solid deal i'll defer to my other members now but uh, don't we want to leave on a positive note seems like a really a good solid deal we're happy to be uh, talking and partnering with you. And, and, um, again, I know just 
some things to think about as it, as it heads towards council. Thank you, Chair. Chair, I believe, I think you're muted, uh, Madam Chair. I got it. <laughs> Christina Allen, questions or comments? Is Christina on mute? Can you hear me, Ginger? Now I can, yes. So, so sorry about that. I had to move to my cell phone, but I just got on. So I'm very excited with all this information and listening to all the people call in. It was very important. But I think once Oracle has really showcased um, all the details, they will answer a lot of their questions because there was a lot of questions that could have been answered prior to the call-ins, and I hope they're able to get that information or it's shared. But more than anything, I think we need to look at the um, that knowing that this is just phase one. From my understanding, everything that's going to do from um, changing the overlay, um, the planning, all of those are going to have community input and questions that the community will have and be able to input their opinions. So I just want to make that acknowledged in the notes that while we are looking at this from a uh, one type of vote. There are so many opportunities for community involvement um, in such an array of different uh, uh, stages of this project where the community will have an input because Oracle's reputation is that they will listen. But based on what they've done, um, it is very impressive. Um, I understand also, my only question I have is, um, which, you know, what type of um, local uh, percentage will come from our designers, our contractors, or um, our um, landscaping. Is there a percentage that you try to hire within our um, region, state, or um, do you bring in people from your other cities to come and do the work? So that's the number one question I've been getting is what kind of local opportunity. And if I missed that, I'm sorry. Yeah, so this is Don Watson. I lead, uh, sorry to introduce myself earlier, I lead Oracle's uh, real estate and facilities management group. And we absolutely will be engaging with the uh, the suppliers and the builders and the contractors in the local area. I've already actually started having conversations with our procurement organization to start thinking about how we would do that. Um, and that even includes, you know, how we would engage with the, the small diverse suppliers that absolutely exist in that area. And, you know, we will, we will build an engagement plan and they will absolutely be, be given opportunities. Um, as we continue to go through this process and really start to think about what what the campus is going to look out look at in the layout and all of those things. Um, then my last question I will add is, um, you know, we've always been a two race state. I'm originally from New Mexico, being Hispanic, I understand Texas very well, and my um, senior in college is moving to Austin, Texas, um, in two months. So, um, while well, you're going to get you'll get someone new there, but. Um, We've always had a small percentage of procurement. This is not, this is just an opinion. Um, and diversity and inclusion um, is done very well in, in, let's say, Texas, because you have more diversity. But uh, I would ri raise the bar as you come in and maybe look at a procurement at a higher level so that more collaboration with small uh, minority business owners and small women business owners have an opportunity of the share of the project um, fees, um, and I think that's where you could also lead in making a difference so that all other companies raise the bar of a collaborative collaborative mindset um, to see what we can do to raise everyone else as well. So that's just an opinion. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. When do you have any questions or comments? Uh, yeah, just a couple. Um, so again, just like everybody else, I want to thank the callers. We heard from a bunch of people with a bunch of perspectives, and it is always heartening and heartwarming to see so many Nashvilleians come and be a part of this process and to really think about the problems facing our city because certainly we are having growing pains and we're going to have to really talk through those as a city to solve some of them. Um, 
I want to thank the mayor for coming. I know that I think I probably am not alone in appreciating that we have a representative from the mayor's office, the mayor himself. Um, but um, input from the leader of our city and the IDB process is sure is certainly welcome. And um, it's a nice change of pace from some of our prior meetings. Um, having said that, I think my questions will be brief. Um, I think companies show us who they are, um, just like people, and Oracle has a much better track record than a lot of other companies. Um, and so I, I feel better about this plan knowing the history of the company and being able to see what they've done other places. I do want to talk for just a minute about the environmental remediation work that's going to have to happen because I know there's been a lot of community pushback and questions about that. Um, I, I am from here, but as I told Jim, the dump site predates my life. Um, and I'm old enough to have a career and three children, so I'm not particularly young, but um, <laughs> Nigel giving me the thumbs up over there, um, but um, in the three children club, but I would like if I don't know if it's Jim or Margaret, or even the mayor's office, who can tell us a little bit about this dump site, because I think a lot of us are lay environmentalists. This is in a floodplain. Um, to me, you know, the city has made messes in the past and I'm pretty thrilled to think that this site is finally going to get cleaned up because I hate the fact that there is a brownfield right in the middle of our city. And if somebody can tell me a little bit about what they expect there, the history of that site, I think that'd be helpful for the community. Well, I'll take a start at that. And then we'll, uh, I think Mark Williams might still be on the call and he can fill in some additional if I leave anything out. But in our due diligence research, we were able to determine that this was a metro dump site from the mid 60s to the mid 70s. And it's been since that time, it's had buildings over top of it. And so as our as part of our investigation of the site, we core drilled around the edges of the buildings, but we couldn't actually get you know into the core of the site because there's two buildings sitting right on top of it. Uh, we didn't find anything from a contamination standpoint that would be problematic at this point, but we don't really know what the order of magnitude of the remediation is going to be until we take the buildings down and figure out what we have to do with what's under those buildings, whether that's removing what's there or leaving it there and just driving pilings to support the buildings. But we know that there's, for example, there's a story in, from the 90s about one of those buildings having its floor sinking and things like that. So there've been issues over in that area, you know, forever. Also throughout the site, not just on the landfill area, there's buried construction de debris that we encountered in our testing from the construction of the interstate. So it's a, it's a site that's got some challenges, but from the landfill standpoint, they're not as much in environmental contamination as they are structural stability because they've been, the site's been closed and had buildings over it since probably, uh, I think the buildings were built in the early eighties. So it's been, that's not, that's within my lifetime, maybe not yours, but. <laughs> I, I get the early eighties, Jim. I just slide right in there I at understand. the beginning. No, I understand, but that's, but they've been there a long time and they, and without any identified problems that have popped up from an environmental standpoint uh, for the last several years, so. Okay, Thanks. just another quick question, just to confirm for everybody listening, I understand that there's some concern the Trail of Tears runs through the site and there are potentially um, some former uh, signs suggesting that there are, um, that there were, there were burial areas within this area. Top Golf, which is right next door, did not have any issues or find anything of, of significance or interest or that needed to be protected when it was developed, but can y'all just confirm that you have done sort of a preliminary analysis of what might be on the site and are prepared for those possibilities? Yeah, that, that's correct. We have done a preliminary investigation, but the problem is what it, you exactly described is where exactly the uh, any remains might be is not yet 
determined. And so what we're anticipating is, as is typical with construction when you're near rivers and streams in this community, that you know, we might encounter a site as we as we start and we'll have to go through and bring in the archeological groups to make sure that if we encounter anything that we can address it and remediate it either by avoiding it or relocating it. Uh, the good thing about having a site with a lot of green space is the relocation options can be, uh, you know, pretty easy to relocate from one site to another if you have to. But at this point, we're, we've not found anything that indicates that there is a site, uh, but we're anticipating that we might. Great, thank you. And thanks to everybody for being here today. Thank, thank you. you. Good questions, Quinn. Um, Tequila Johnson, I wanna recognize you for questions or comments. Thank you, Chair Howard. <laughs> Um, I have a lot of questions. Uh, most of them you can find in the Tennessee article. There are about 21 of them. Um, but I'll start off by saying, I think that this is a great deal. I think that Oracle is a, a company that has a pretty decent track record. And I think that everyone here has best, the best intentions for Nashville. However, we know that the road to hell is often paved in golden intentions. And so I, what my questions are is, the first one that I have, what is the true value of this incentive? How are we valuing this? If, if Metro were to do infrastructure on their own under any normal circumstances, how much of this would Oracle be paying anyway? I, what I don't understand is how we have got to that $175 million. Um, it's, I, I get that there are all these things that Oracle is agreeing to do up front, um, but what I'm not understanding is how much of that would normally be covered by Metro and how much of it would normally be covered by the developers. Yep. So who, who, uh, who wants to answer that question? I'm probably the best person to answer that question at this point. Hey, um, Jim. Jim, before yeah. you start, and I and I'm and I don't want to cut into Tequila's time, but I think maybe because this was a question I also had. So Tequila, thank you for your question. But I think Jim, maybe another way to also answer her question is for this specific project, the 175 million that's being dedicated uh, for the infrastructure. Just to clarify that that is not construction of the actual buildings, Oracle's buildings. That it's infrastructure, and also clarify how much of that what portion of that is actually going to be public infrastructure that would be dedicated that's open to anyone to use? I think that's also maybe where Tequila is going with her question. No, sure. I wasn't going there. I was actually I'm sorry. under any normal circumstance, how much would the developer be required to pay? So of all of the infrastructure that is proposed, sidewalks, street signs, um, anything like that that's being proposed, if you, if Oracle were just a normal private developer and we were not looking at doing a TIF deal with them, how much of that infrastructure would they be responsible for without any um, incentives from Metro? So Jim, why don't, why don't you answer, but then we may, I don't know who all from Metro is, is still on, but we may want Metro to also sort of respond. Sure, so, so the first item that I can pull out and talk about is the bridge. Uh, no developer is going to build a pedestrian bridge across the river as part of its project, period. That's all uh, something that if Metro wanted a pedestrian bridge across the river, Metro would build a pedestrian bridge. There was a, a prior discussion with uh, Monroe about uh, doing something with some kind of uh, uh, participation through a central business improvement district to try to fund the bridge. I don't think they ever were able to identify enough funding to make that happen. So the bridge would be one that would, would not be a typical development type op, op, obligation. Parks at the, at the park at the ground at the bridge is also not a typically a, a developer obligation. The, uh, one of the, one of the improvements is, uh, dealing with an undersized uh, uh, sanitary sewer pump station that is serving East Nashville and right now is in need of upsizing. So the developer would have paid a portion of that, but not the whole cost here. The developer's paying all the cost of that. 
and the same for some of the road improvements. Some of the road improvements would be things that would be uh, things that would be done by that could be done by a developer if a developer was willing to put up that money, uh, or the developers would wait until Metro uh, upsized those. And that's part of the problem here. Is this area has such infrastructure deficiencies that waiting for Metro to do it would mean it would develop for many years. So that's the rationale behind this public infrastructure is that it allows this site to be developed now and to Metro start realizing tax revenues now as opposed to many years down the future. And if someone wants from Metro wants to weigh in. Dear Lady Hauser, this is Mike Jamison with the mayor's office. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Mike. I am joined here today. Uh, I won't subject you to the video of this face, but I wanted to uh, 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 advise the IDB members that with us on, I think maybe his first full day at work is our new ECD director, Courtney Pogue. I, I cannot put this upon him since he just uh, arrived in Nashville shortly. But I'm also joined by Mark Sturdivant, our Director of Infrastructure Development, and Tom Cross, the Deputy Director at the Metro Legal Department. I did want to chime in and just with respect to how this might ordinarily be done, uh, just point out to the IDB members the significant improvements that this proposal has over a typical TIF deal that Metro and the Metro Council has, has approved in the past. We typically take the tax increment from an improvement and use that money as the financial basis for obtaining bonds, bonds taken out by the metropolitan government, bonds that are incurred risk upon the metropolitan government and bonds upon which we pay interest. None of that applies here. The 175 is Oracle's money being spent for them to develop our infrastructure. This public infrastructure, the public infrastructure being the term used in the project agreement means just that. These are streets, roads, facilities, utilities, parks, greenways that will be for the benefit and use and ownership of the public. We have not, at least in my memory, ever encountered a deal with that level of uh, participation, if not generosity, by the underlying company. I don't know if, if Mr. Cross or Mr. Sturdivant want to want to add to that answer, but that is how this compares to how this would ordinarily be done. And that's why the advantages are so extreme in this case. Gentlemen, do you want to add to the comments? Yeah, this, is, this is Mark Sturdivant. Um, one of the other things about this uh, project that's a little unusual is the scale of it. Um, River North Phase One was 13 million. The yards was 15 million. For us to to take on 175 million would really uh, strain our whole capital budget system. So that's another factor in this. Thank you. See, Keila, I want to make sure that you've gotten uh, your questions answered. So uh, I'll go back to you. Yeah, not really. I think everyone told me why this is attractive and why, how the infrastructure is going to happen, but no one really explained to me how this incentive value and why is this infrastructure um, being added into this deal? Um, I get that the city wants this infrastructure, but we've been, it's been sitting there for these, this long amount of years. Who's to say that Metro Nashville over time could not develop this infrastructure itself and save money on the back end without having to reimburse Oracle for um, the infrastructure that they're paying up front. I will agree with everyone on this call that it is probably one of the best deals that we've had. Um, but I do think that for Nashville and where we are as a city, that the deal could be much better. So I'll just stop there because no one was actually able to answer my question. I understand that it is a very complicated question, but none of the answers were essentially what I was looking for. I was looking for an actual number that said, you know, per Metro policy, X amount of infrastructure has to be paid for by the developer. Um, if it was a private developer. What I'm hearing is bridges and sidewalks, and let's just be real, a bridge isn't necessarily a infrastructure need. It's something that we want that would be more convenient. But if we were to poll the community, I'm sure there would be more infrastructure needs that the community would want to prioritize over a bridge. Uh, so I'll stop there with that question. My next question is more for Oracle. 
Um, I love the programming that Oracle does. I've seen some amazing things. Uh, when I saw in the news that Oracle was coming and they were bringing 8,500 jobs and the minimum, the median uh, income would be around six figures, I was excited because to me that equated to hopefully lots of rich single men moving to Nashville. <laughs> <laughs> Looking at Oracle's 2018 EEO report, uh, not many of them will be black. Uh, in fact, one out of 141 senior officials in 2018, less than 1% um, of Oracle's executives were black. And so my question is, what inroads has, because we know what happened in Austin, uh, the black population has declined, declined by about 6% in the last five, six years. So that's something that we don't want to see happen in Nashville. We don't want to lose the culture of Nashville in order to gain um, Oracle, because the culture of Nashville is what attracts um, businesses like Oracle to Nashville. So what inroads has Oracle made uh, within within Black communities, specifically Black communities? How is Oracle going to ensure that there's businesses done with Black communities, that small Black-owned businesses aren't overrun, um, that, you know, Black people are being employed? And, and quite frankly, are you, do you guys have a plan to increase uh, Black management in your company? Jennifer, do we have a you for that or someone else? This is Tracy. And yeah. Jennifer, would you like me to take that one? Please, I couldn't unmute, but yes, please. Hello, everyone. I'm Tracy Wade, and I lead diversity and, and inclusion for Oracle. And Tequila, your, your question is definitely valid. I will tell you that diversity and diversifying our organization all, overall for diverse representation and certainly at the executive leadership roles is critical and important. We are working with our executive leadership recruiting organization on an ongoing basis to talk about the value impact of hiring more diversity, Blacks, Hispanic women into leadership roles is very much top of mind. Our executives at Oracle are working on strategies and initiatives to make sure that we're building that talent pool as well. We have an executive diversity council within Oracle of our executives, of which Safra Katz herself is the executive sponsor. And where we're standing up plans, project plans, and initiatives to hold ourselves accountable with diversity and diversifying the talent pool. You'll see externally that our numbers are shared on our external website, so you saw those numbers there. And that is part of our strategy, part of our global DNI imperatives of what one is data and having the data available, awareness. We're talking to our executives on an ongoing basis, making sure they are aware of their representation at all levels of roles within Oracle. We're also, our recruiting organization is recruiting again, as I mentioned earlier, with intention. And we're also leveraging our employee resource groups with referral programs so that they are actively being the voice in the community as well, referring in talent to Oracle as well. We're doing that as we're building out the community that's, that our employees want to stay and grow. And they're assisting with that messaging external to build that diverse pipeline in our executive roles and all roles within Oracle so that individuals could stay, grow, and evolve. So I hope that may answer your question, Tequila. And Tracy, I just want to say that um, not only do you have a beautiful office right there, but um, which is fantastic styling, um, but some of the information in the data, this body, and I think the council has found super valuable um, to kind of come back and allow you to tell that story, right? Right now, you're unknown. Five years from now, Tracy, to have you come back to the IDB or the council and say, you know, Tequila, I heard you, and let me tell you where we are today. Absolutely. Um, I think would be really helpful so that we really have an understanding about your impact. Absolutely. And, and again, that's why we are sharing the data, because we want to be open. We want to be honest. We're, we're, and we look no different than many tech companies, quite frankly. So we own that. We know there's work to be done. We have programs and initiatives and partnerships out in the community that will help us to expand our representation um, across all roles, as well as, you know, certainly engagements with, with those entry-level roles from historically Black colleges and universities as well. So there's lots of work that we're doing there. 
Is there opportunity? Absolutely. We're aware of it and we're digging in to make a difference. Tequila, I want to make sure that I didn't cut you off. Are there other questions or comments? <laughs> You did, but that's fine, Ginger. I know you wanted to. You Her office, I just had to say, it's beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, so you 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 gave a great story, Tracy, um, but what I heard was what Oracle is wanting to do and planning to do, but I didn't really hear anything that showcased that Oracle has, or any of those plans have actually materialized into increases in not just diversity and inclusion, but black people in executive senior uh, leadership. I haven't heard that. I would be un be interested to know how many black people are on your board. Uh, as a matter of fact, how many Southern people are on your board uh, would be another question that I would, would like to know. Um, and the reason why I'm asking these questions is not to make anyone uncomfortable um, or to make anyone feel like I'm, I'm attacking anything, but these kinds of things um, showcase where a company's uh, a value is. You know, can sure. look at the people who are in the decision-making positions and see if you really value community, if you really value diversity, if you really value inclusion. And according to their EEO report, Oracle does not value diversity and inclusion in a way in which someone like myself would like to see. So that's really why I asked that question. But Tracy, thank you so much. You did a, a, did a wonderful job um, at answering that question. My last question would be, are there any, um, from, from my understanding, once this goes through IDB, a lot of this deal cannot be restructured at the city council level. It can only be voted up or voted down. And so with that being said, I want to know, have there been any conversations about a potential particip participation agreement where all of these things, these wonderful things that Oracle's talking about, I mean, I really think Oracle's a great company. I do. I think that Oracle is trying, but I would just like to see some of this in writing. I would like to know that Oracle is not only trying, but there are a set of things that they're going to be accountable to. Um, and it's something that's in writing that we can, we can verify. So I don't know if it's uh, Oracle or if it should be the city that sort of answers what, what are the processes, right? I know that this impact plan is just step one, and then there's rezoning, and then there's potentially parks board, and then it, so can, can somebody, whoever the right person is, sort of run that process through for the group and um, to you know, that's, that's, that's probably key. Um, so obviously the first step is uh, today's vote and then the second step would be the council's vote on the economic impact plan. Uh, at that point, then Oracle is going to start into a very detailed design plan, uh, planning process for the site. That hasn't been done yet. This is a situation where the design work, the the working with planning, working on the rezoning that's, that are gonna be needed, all those things are still to be done. Uh, that's gonna be the process, that planning process, it's gonna really flesh out what the infrastructure is gonna look like from the standpoint of you know, what the, where the roads are gonna be located, what the road widths, where the bike lanes are gonna be, all the details that everyone wants to know about the infrastructure will start to get fleshed out. The same with the greenways and the parks. We've got work with parks to do on the park design at the foot of the bridge. We've got work to do with parks on where the greenways are gonna be located. Those things are all gonna be incorporated as a part of that planning process that will start soon after we acquire the property, hopefully in June. So that's still a lot of work to be done to, to identify uh, exactly what the infrastructure is going to be and where it's going to be located. Um, then we will need to get some of the property will need to be rezoned and we'll also need to revise the urban design overlay because right now it contemplates a much more dense urban style development uh, and the campus approach that Oracle is proposing doesn't really fit within that. And so we've been working with planning on, on taking or uh, creating an amendment to the urban design overlay. That will have to be approved by council. So that's another council vote that will be uh, out there that we will have to uh, deal with. And then as we identify and finalize the infrastructure, that's when we're gonna identify which of that will be under a participation agreement with Metro and which of that will be done just by Oracle. So those are still things that will will need to happen going forward. 
and we'll need to involve Metro and the council in those processes going forward. So we anticipate a good good number of those things happening in the next eight to 10 months as we go through the planning process and before we start, are ready to start any construction on the project. So is, is that in your opinion, that eight to 10 months, really that community process, um, right. working through those sorts of issues? Right. And, and then sort of one thing you probably didn't mention it could, that we don't know yet is if there is then a state investment of economic development, that will come to this body to accept basically that. That's a, that is a good point. That is another point that assuming that the state makes an investment, the board will also see that as well. The agreement, because that is an agreement with the board and then the board makes an agreement with uh, Oracle on that. So those would also be things that this board would vote on. Okay. So to keep up, any other questions, comments, or? Um, just one last comment. Mm -hmm. That not necessarily answer my question either, because from what I'm understanding from my research is that this deal, this agreement cannot be amended by council once it passes the IDB. And I think from my interactions with over 200 community members in the last three days about this deal, they are less concerned with the design elements and more concerned about the economic impact, which is what we're pretty much discussing right now. And they would like to see a participation agreement in place before we agree to give any tax incentives to any other company. So I just want to, you know, make that statement and I'm going to, you know, yield my time just so everyone else can have an opportunity to answer. But I do want to publicly state in the record that community members want to see a participation agreement in place before the city issues any type of uh, tax incentive. Thank you, Chair Hauser. Thank you. And next on my list, I have Sarah Hanna. So Sarah, I just want to allow you to uh, make some comments or ask some questions. Thank you, Chair. Um, I also just want to start by thanking the community, Oracle, and everybody who's participated in this meeting. Um, you know, while there are a lot of questions, clearly a lot of thought has gone into this project and the structure of the proposed incentive. Um, I think this is an exciting opportunity for Nashville and its citizens, but as we've heard today, there, there are a lot of valid concerns that need to be part of the continued conversation. Um, yeah, you know, what I'm hearing today, I am encouraged by Oracle's track record and the feedback to a lot of the great questions um, my fellow board members have asked. Um, and I think as we, you know, move forward in these conversations, uh, I'm encouraged that we seem to have a, a good partner to continue those conversations with. Um, I do also want to thank my fellow board members. They, you know, the benefit of going towards the end is they've asked a lot of the really great questions um, that needed to be asked and. Um, you know, hopefully that as we again continue these conversations, they will be uh, answered in more detail. Um, you know, I am particularly interested in, I think we got good responses on the education initiative, public use of the green space. I'm encouraged that there is some, you know, good track record on that piece. Um, and as a uh, also a lifelong resident in Middle Tennessee, I'm also very encouraged to see them, you know, us making better use of our of our river and hopefully remediating a, a brown space a brownfield there. Um, so I don't have any additional questions to to address at this time. I do want to disclose prior to the vote. Um, I am a former partner at Bradley Arendt Bolt Cummings, which is the law firm representing Oracle. I've talked with Margaret about this. It doesn't. It is not a um, a current conflict, but I do want to disclose that um, I was a, a partner with the law firm that is representing Oracle, um, but that has been over um, over twelve months ago. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, Winnie Forrester, questions, comments. Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, um, really was heartened by everybody that called in, even though we had to sit through hours of it, it was really great. And uh, amazing that at 10 o'clock on a Tuesday morning that that many people were clued in because I think a lot of folks don't even know what the IDB is or does. And 
And, you know, one of the things that uh, I've been on this board for a little over a year now, and I take it really seriously. Um, and one of the things that I did in preparing for this meeting is I went and looked up our mission. And, you know, it's about bringing economic development and jobs and training and everything you would think of uh, to our area. But it's also about improving the quality of life of our citizens. And, uh, and I just wonder how this is going to affect low income and minority folks in our city. Is it going to rise their quality of life? And, you know, some of you may know that I live close to uh, River North. I live north of River North, a, a couple of miles, but I live in the Haynes Trinity area, and we have neighborhoods that border, directly border the area. And the Haynes Trinity area is historically black. And it is still that way. Um, we have not experienced the kind of gentrification yet, uh, say, that lower Dickerson Road has. And But we see it at our doorstep. And over close to 70% of the callers talked about um, concerns about affordable housing, gentrification. And that's the first time since since the public hearing was closed that we're talking about it again because I'm talking about it. And I can't help but wonder the slide that, um, that Jennifer Burke presented about why Oracle wants to come to Nashville. One of the bullet points was affordable affordability, but she didn't talk about it, but it was on the slide. So I guess my question that I have for Oracle, and I think that uh, Kay Bowers brought this up, which was really good. You know, has Oracle done any impact studies on affordable housing issues, uh, gentrification, displacement? And uh, if you haven't, why not? And I'm sure that this is a concern in other cities that you are in. And I'd like to know how you have addressed and help alleviate those issues and how will you imply, um, how will you take those lessons and apply them in Nashville? That's my first question. Thanks, Winnie. And uh, Jim, who, who from Oracle would like to respond? And then I don't know if the city, you know, the mayor's opening comments, if they have any comments to make related to that, too. Um, I mean, I, I can say that I know that we've, that, and I'm not aware of there being any impact on a uh, study being done on affordable housing by Oracle. Um, I'm not aware of any company that does an impact study on affordable housing uh, based on their developments uh, because that's not. Uh, necessarily the responsibility of each company to solve an existing problem in the community. Uh, but at the same time, we also recognize the importance of uh, the impact, and that's part of the mayor's and council members, uh, as far as resolution, the mayor's mentioned the resolution amendment that Councilman Swar has to utilize the uh, percentage of the the additional tax money that's coming from this project to be used for affordable housing. That's the first time that's ever been done in this community where uh, the, the taxes from a new development is being dedicated to that. And so I think from the standpoint of Oracle, we look at that as being, you know, a positive contribution to the community that results from the expenditure of the $1.2 billion that Oracle is spending for the development of its project. Okay. Does, anybody, does anybody else from the city or Oracle want to make any comments? If not, we'll go back to Wendy for comments for us. Chair Hauser, this is Mike Jamison. Just to flesh out uh, the impact of Council Lady Suarez's amendment, 
Um, what that proposes is that if, if adopted by the council as an amendment to the, uh, the resolution considered by the council next week, the city would then, the council's intent would be to uh, allocate um, a significant portion, I believe Council Lady Suarez says one half of the additional tax revenues that the city would see uh, to the Barnes Fund and other affordable housing mechanisms. If, if I'm doing the math right, that would increase by 50% our affordable housing dollars by virtue of one development. And not only is that a historic ratio, that's that's not been done before. And um, to, to put the onus of, of solving affordable housing on one development is, is, I would submit, slightly unrealistic. But likewise, we've never seen that level of contribution resulting from one development. And we would be uh, grateful and I think foolish to bypass that opportunity. Hey, Ms. Forrester, maybe just from, from the Oracle, Oracle perspective, it's Brian Higgins. Look, I think we, we see that and in, in, in every community that we're in, in terms of the affordable housing issues, and, and quite frankly, in every community, I think everywhere, there's a lot of tech development. Um, I think, as Jim said, we're not well positioned to solve the affordable housing problems, whether in Silicon Valley or in Nashville. Um, that being said, I know as you know, we're going to be a partner in the community with, with everyone in Nashville. We hope to be. And I'm sure we're, we'd be more than willing to sort of have discussions with the right people in terms of if there are things we can do, you know, on the affordable housing front to, to consider it and, and, and think about it and talk about it with the appropriate with the appropriate parties. So has Oracle ever built any housing on their campuses and would you consider doing it here in Nashville? Not that I'm aware of. We've never done that. And, and also the zone for it. But. And also, part part of the, part of the answer to that is this project is right next to the Creek Lane development, where they're already building a bunch of uh, housing. And so, again, Oracle looks at that as one of the attractive features for this site because it provides a place where it, its employees can live in close proximity and not have to develop its own. You know, affordable. I mean, his own multifamily complex to be able to, you know, provide convenient housing for his employees because it's already being developed right next door. If, if I may add, um, I'm a member of the American College of Real Estate Attorneys, and um, and on the Homelessness Task Force, and single best thing people can do as a community is have a dedicated revenue stream that can help solve this problem. That's exactly what the city's proposing with this amendment. Okay, I need to take issue with that because this, this is a resolution and it's non-binding. It's my understanding that the council would have to vote every year and it'd have to you know, be allocated in the budget. This is not an ordinance. This is not what we need to solve our housing crisis. And so, you know, one of the things I take issue about is that the mayor himself, when he was running for office, made affordable housing. He stated that he was going to make it an integral part of every incentive deal that he, that he did in the city of Nashville. So that has not been the case here. It is not part of this. There is a resolution that's supposed to come to council next week, but it is just an intent. It is not an ordinance. It does not actually designate the money. All it says is we'd like to do this. So the other thing that I take issue with here is that it was less than a week ago that we were given all these materials. It was last Wednesday when we were given a volume of materials to review. So I heard plainly when people were calling in today saying that everything was so rushed um, that they hadn't had time to absorb it, to have community, you know, widespread community meetings before the deal was sealed and couldn't be changed. Um, we don't, you know, the IDB board has not even had uh, a director for most of a year. 
and then we are given all this material in less than seven days and asked to make a decision and then it moves on to council where it's a straight up and down vote. I don't consider that community involvement. You know, so I just say that to, to let you know I do have concerns about that. Uh, but I do have one more question for Oracle and it's, and it was, um, nobody has asked it before, I don't think. But I was interested in the scholars program and the minority scholarships and uh, internships. And if Oracle could tell us how many scholarships there actually are and what we could expect just in the city of Nashville to be offered to our college uh, students. So, but someone else about to speak. I'm sorry. No, Tracy, go ahead. Okay, great. Thank you. So that is again another Tracy question. So currently, with one of our uh, our scholarship programs, we we oh gosh, we partner with Oracle Giving to provide several different scholarships to Blacks, Hispanic, veterans, disabled community, um, certainly women. So we have several, and I, I apologize for not having that actual number prepared to share with you, but I can, sh I can state we have several different scholarship programs and we partner really closely with Oracle Giving to provide those dollars into the community and supporting underrepresented groups and, and, cer and certainly targeting in many ways our disadvantaged communities to make a greater impact. We also have, was there a question? Okay. We also have our internship programs. We have a UNCF corporate scholars as well as our developer scholars program of which we have over 30 internships that we provide. And that's just one of our internship programs through diversity of which in that particular internship, there is another 300,000 provided to Blacks, Hispanics, Native Americans, uh, again, looking at our underrepresented groups. And that is an annual internship program that we have as well. So does that answer your question, Winnie? Winnie, Winnie you might be on mute. So what you're saying is that it's a handful of opportunities offered to select college students. See, could I maybe add to that and, and expand a little bit? As I mentioned, much of our hiring program is, is targeted at college graduates. We have a program called the Class Of, which we started about eight or 10 years ago, where we hired at its peak roughly 1,500 college graduates each year and brought them into our sales organization and continued with a workforce development plan where we continue to train them and build them into our future leaders at Oracle or out in the communities. That program has targeted and consistently met roughly 20% diversity and inclusion in our hiring. And that again would be from local universities um, as well as other pl places around the United States. So it doesn't answer exactly your scholarship, but we very much are focused on hiring uh, individuals and helping them grow their career with Oracle and providing them the training as, as well to do so. And I would like to just add as well, through our partnership with UNCF, which is over 20 years, we have provided over $12 million in internship scholarships. $12 million in internships, scholarships, and in-kind donations. So this is, these are relationships that are vital and important. Um, actually, the partnership with UNCF was actually started by Safra herself, and so she's very committed um, to the partnership with UNCF. We have expanded that partnership in several other ways, but again, we, you know, this is a commitment that's very important to the organization, Class Of. We're partnering and engaging with historically black college and universities, such as your Tennessee State. Um, you know, certainly different HBCUs across uh, all the different HBCUs to expand talent pool 
to make a greater impact on the talent. And also we're investing in the schools in a different way um, with the HBCUs in particular, because we've created executive engagements. So that's our executives partnering with the deans of the schools to better understand where are the opportunities where Oracle can make an impact. We've joined advisory councils. We are actually involved with uh, some lecture series where we do, we're providing lecturing. We're providing some scholarships directly to those schools as well, so those particular schools as well. In addition to that, we're providing other funding. And in partnership with that, if I can just defer to Denise, and maybe you could talk a little bit more about the Oracle Academy. I know you talked about public schools, but maybe how we're again, as I heard you talk about Winnie, impacting and touching the community. There is another opportunity where I think that, Denise, you could share a bit more with Oracle Academy. You're so right, Tracy. You know, one of the things that um, I love about diversity, inclusion, and Oracle Academy is together, we, we work lockstep to work with universities like HBCUs, Tennessee State in particular, so that that student experience coming from some of the things that Tracy just described, lecture series, working with Oracle executives, it helped boosts uh, that student experience. And then with Oracle Academy, bringing in the curriculum, the opportunities for faculty to engage with the students on a daily basis through their teaching and learning, that is going to elevate their their industry skills so that as you know when you combine all of that i think all in all it really helps um our students uh prepare for you know a multitude of of industries um because they've got the skills they've had the experience as they step into that workforce and so with that it's really building a relationship with the schools where we're partnering hand in hand with Oracle Academy, Oracle Education, so that we're not just providing a scholarship and it's a one and done. We're building long term where we are engaging uh, the candidates. We want to bring them back in for internships. We want to hire them and provide uh, contingent offers before they leave. So I, I do want to just leave you with the fact that this is a very high touch partnership engagement. Our scholarships come from different perspectives. As I said, the UNCF, we just heard about that one partnership, but again, with Oracle of Giving, with the partnership we have with uh, that Dean shared, there is a vast engagement of how we're collaborating to build impactful and again, sustainable relationships. That's right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I just, I just have one more question. Okay. No. Um, there's been talk about deferring deferring our vote, and I'd like to hear why shouldn't we do that to allow more community input? Uh, would there be a problem if we did that? And I don't know if, the, if we want to go to the city or if we want to go to Jim Murphy. It's, it's probably Oracle to take that. Okay. If that's okay. Yeah, it's it would actually be... Um, very problematic and, and jeopardize the deal, Ms. Forrester. I mean, we have a, a contract, and I won't get too deep into the weeds on the on the legal contract, but we have a contract with Monroe Partners. We had a due diligence period um, that runs ends in the middle of May, at which point we're either forced to continue with the deal um, or we can terminate and walk away. And so we want to make sure that this is locked up um, and we know we know the deal that we're we're going into uh, with the city before we close. Um, and so I think my understanding of the process, and I don't know all the processes in, in Nashville, but deferring it would push us out past that that mid-May date and um, create problems for the overall, jeopardize the, the overall transaction. Any other comments from the city or from Oracle on, on the process piece and timing? Sure. Chair Hauser, this is Mike Jameson again, and just it might be a poignant moment to remind the members that this is, as you yourself noted, the first of several public engagements yes. to the extent so many of the issues raised today address issues. I say this with enormous respect for the IDB, but addresses issues that are somewhat outside of the IDB wheelhouse. Um, this uh, the, the council body, the public, the planning commission, all of them will be required to conduct public hearings 
uh, and take public comment with respect to the base zoning uh, required, the UDO uh, amendments that will be required, any acceptance of park amenities has to go before the parks board, any acceptance of state incentives almost certainly has to come back before the council. And so those opportunities remain after today. Thanks, Mike. Um, um, Chair Hauser. Yes, I don't know who's speaking, but um, it's Christina. Yes. Oh, hey, Christina. <laughs> it, it, it's it's Christina. Sorry about that. Um, no, I just want to make a note. Um, I worked. Um, I was fortunate to consult and work with the um, state of Tennessee Economic and Community Development under Haslam and Haggerty. Um, during international trade. In that process, I was involved um, on the side with recruiting companies um, and, and understanding how to market Tennessee as a great state that we are, as well as Nashville. Um, in doing so, I just really see the due diligence that's been done. Um, I'm not trying to disrespect any of the callers or a lot of the questions, but um, a lot of the questions you will see have been answered or can be answered with additional um, research um, if some of the callers or some of the IDB board members um, have that. But I do know that the due, the due diligence and the community um, support is always on the mind of the anyone in ECD and recruiting companies. Um, so, you know, I, I, I believe in the people that we've hired or elected and feel confident that they're doing this for the best of Nashville because we know that we can't give it away anymore. We know we're a great city and we know that uh, Oracle's setting the bar, bar high. And if we could set it higher through the community engagements, I think we will. And I think they're getting a the taste. Um, so, you know, I just want to note that working under the ECD, I understand every question that's proposed to us because we have to think about it before um, our colleagues and our supporters ask us. So I just want that noted if, if that's okay. Thank you. And Nigel, I haven't um, gone to you for any opportunities for questions or comments. Sure. Well, first of all, good afternoon, everyone. I hope everybody's still awake. <laughs> Maybe so because we skipped lunch. Um, but anyway, first of all, thank you, Chair Hauser. I have snacks. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Chair Hauser. Thank you to my fellow board members. Thank you to everyone from Metro on the call. And, and certainly thank you to Oracle. Um, and certainly thank you to all the callers who, who stayed on hold and, and waited their turn to speak. Again, I am Nigel Hodge. Uh, I'll give you my perspective. I'm from Nashville, so I'm born and raised, uh, attended public schools, graduate of the great Hume Fogg Academic, and that is a shot at one of my fellow board members, uh, but graduated from the Hume Fogg. Uh, so I'm a huge proponent of public education. I work in corporate real estate. I'm a minority. And so a, a lot of the items and, and questions that have come up over the last two weeks are certainly items that I can relate to. Um, my perspective today is going to be based on obviously my experience and certainly conversations with, with a slew of people from a variety of backgrounds in, in trying to prepare and educate myself about, about this. So, with that said, what I'd like to do, Chair Hauser, is take a couple of minutes, have a couple of questions, kind of just big picture questions, and then uh, have some more specific questions about the project that I'll defer to Oracle and maybe their representation on. So let me start off with this. And again, these are questions. Uh, I know some of our board, some of the questions that I had, some of our board members have already asked. So I will, I will skip, I will skip those. But one of the first items, and, and these are items that, I, that I've heard from people over the last week or so, uh, came up today. Uh, so I'll, I'll go to the mayor's office first, and I'll defer to, to whoever is best suited to answer the question. But, you know, on, on the Industrial Development Board, obviously, just to clarify, we are not negotiating these deals. That's not, that's not our role. That's not what we're doing. So I want to put that out there and clarify that for folks first. But... You know, we have consistently heard, and this predates our current mayor, there are people that feel these deals are done in a vacuum, done behind closed doors, and then suddenly there's information out there. And, you know, 
people feel that it's not uh, out there for the general residents. So I guess my question is just to the mayor's office, what, what, are, what are your thoughts on that? Or, or what do you have to say to, to folks that feel that these deals are, and specifically this deal are done uh, and negotiated uh, in the background without any community engagement from the average resident here in Nashville? Thank you for that question, Mr. Hodge, as sure. this is Mike Jamison. Um, so state law specifies the, the process that is used for both economic impact plan approvals and tax increment finance, uh, two separate sections, but essentially within the same statutory framework. And they lay out a process that's pretty definitive and has been followed, I think, for decades and followed before the IDB. What state law says is that the IDB uh, gets the documentation and puts out a newspaper notice and convenes a public hearing. Then it comes before the council by resolution. That process has been done uh, both under TIF and under EIPs repeatedly for uh, the, the 57 years of Metro's existence uh, to, as, as best as I can tell, to everyone's satisfaction. I'm not aware of any attempts to amend the state legislation saying that's insufficient uh, processing. Um, just by nature of how uh, companies and outside parties approach a mayor's office, yes, I imagine there is a letter or phone call that is not uh, broadcast to the world. But as soon as we got the documentation that, that encapsulates what this is, the, the project agreement and the EIP, uh, those were actually first finalized and submitted to the uh, the IDB uh, and then provided to us uh, shortly after that, whereupon we immediately disseminated them to the Metro Council. Um, the Metro Council has taken obviously their role seriously. Uh, I noticed that the budget and finance chair, uh, uh, Council Lady Toombs, uh, issued an email to all council members at the beginning of this week, noting there is some time sensitivity to this, uh, please be reminded of this public hearing before the IDB. Please be reminded of the Budget and Finance Committee meeting that addresses this on May 3rd. And please note that Oracle will be there available for uh, a special hearing if requested and be reminded of the May 4th meeting. So the, the outreach has been, I think, a little bit more detailed and, and nuanced in this case than in the litany of those that have preceded it. Um, and I, I think we've we've done our best to get the information out there as soon as it was available and, and possible. Sure, thank you. Thank you for that. And so to expand upon that just even more and, and tell me if I'm correct. So one of the challenges obviously too is that these are big deals uh, uh, valued in, in working with the companies such as Oracle. I would think there's probably some sort of non-disclosure agreements in place as well that prevent um, information from being leaked before the deal is finalized. Is that correct? Well, uh, there is uh, there is state legislation that deals with um, public records requests and what sort of information okay. is subject to that. We've we've not been uh, caught up in that. I don't think that has caused any particular problems. But in response to your particular mm -hmm. issue. Uh, yes, you do have companies that, that come and explore, and they want to do it without the threat of their uh, sensitive job information being disclosed to the world. So state law specifically uh, excludes that from being um, shared um, pursuant to public records requests. But in this particular case, um, I'm, I'm sort of glancing around the room here. I'm not aware of any documents that we received that were then uh, the subject of a public records request that we didn't respond to. As soon as, as soon as we got them, they were pretty much IDB uh, records as well. And I think you got what we got uh, within fairly short order. Okay. All right. Well, great. Thank you. Thank you for the explanation. So the the other topic that has come up, and and I'll I'll, I'll go to you go to you maybe Mike or someone from your team first, and then maybe ask Oracle to, Oracle to comment. But certainly one of the other topics, key themes of of today, and something that that this board has discussed, and something that's discussed across our city. And I work on corporate real estate and and uh, deal in residential as well uh, personally is the fact the cost of living and you know the obviously in nashville nashville is growing it's the it city and 
and prices have continued to rise uh, because a lot of people want to be here. And there's a lot of reasons for that. But certainly there's been a lot of talk today, as, as you've heard, about affordable housing. So I'm not sure if Hannah Davis is on. I know she was supposed to join us. I'm not sure if she is on. But what is the what what is the response or or any comment from the mayor's office to those that say that these types of incentive deals um, actually uh, not to say that a company like Oracle caused the affordable housing problem because we know that certainly these challenges already existed, but. What is the comments from the mayor's office uh, for those that think that these type of deals exacerbate that problem and, and make it make it worse? Well, I, I don't know that I've checked the absolute latest statistic on this, but I remember not too long ago See. hearing that, that we have about 100 people moving uh, to this city uh, nearly every day. And so, as I was sort of hinting at earlier, this is this is going to be a problem that is on us as a city, and I would hope not be set before the the foot of of any one company um, to resolve uh, and and let us otherwise be paralyzed before being able to move forward. This is going to continue to be a problem um, that will require continued effort. Um, I alluded earlier to the uh, piece of legislation coming from Council Member uh, Suara that is, uh, declares the intent to allocate uh, an, an enormous portion, 50% of the revenues to affordable housing and the Barnes Fund. And again, that is historic. Yes, we cannot eliminate the budget ordinance role that it comes up every year before council, we can't cancel, we cannot cancel the council's role in formulating that budget ordinance. And so it's up to them every year to allocate the proceeds, but that's what you would want at the end of the day. The, the particular site at hand, sometimes we encounter redevelopment sites that would, would be displacing residents. That is not the case here for anyone who would have the opportunity to tour the location. There is no immediate housing offsite, uh, offset in, in this case. But our affordable housing task force has been commissioned. They are making enormous progress. We received an update from Council at Large Berkeley Allen. We also have the Amazon pledge um, of two billion, uh, which we are uh, doing our best to uh, finalize and make sure we make the best uh, use of those resources. But I, I think all of that to say this is a, a multifactorial response, and we have to come at it as we have with several solutions from several angles rather than attributing it to any one entity uh, that has itself declared its interest in addressing uh, the affordable housing challenges. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for the response. I will, uh, like I said, I, I won't comment a lot because I, I just want to get to the questions and, and let my fellow board members hear the answer. So I, I appreciate your, your response. Uh, I'll have some more specific questions now for for maybe the uh, people here at Oracle. So, a couple another item for this board that that's really important for us is certainly uh, with with companies moving to Nashville. It certainly is, and again, I'm from here. I live here. Uh, we certainly want as much as possible for for the individuals that are benefiting from these types of incentive deals to live, work, play here in Metro Nashville, Davidson County. So a couple questions. So for your 80, I know it will take years before we get to that 8,500 number, but once construction is finished and you're doing your initial hiring, are you relocating people from other areas or, or will the majority or what percentage will be relocated from other areas and what percentage are going to be, are you just hiring local folks here, here in Nashville? I'll take that for Oracle, it's Jennifer. So as I mentioned, the, the hub that we envision would be primarily focused on our engineering talent as well okay. as sales talent, much of which will be hire, hired directly from the college campus. And so again, to the extent we can source that talent locally, we absolutely would intend to do so. To the extent, you know, as I mentioned before, we might source talent that grew up in Nashville, but maybe went to college or university elsewhere, that could be the case. Um, but we definitely focus on local talent. 
um, for many reasons, not only for the reasons that you've brought up, but it also improves long-term retention of employees, right? They want to go back to where they grew up and be in their hometown and live in their local community, and that's proved very successful for us. We do find at time when we're scaling a new hub, we sometimes have to bring in the senior level managers from other hubs because we can't invent that locally. Somebody who knows Oracle, who knows our programs and can grow this talent. To the extent we can find that talent, we'll absolutely hire locally, but that's where we've traditionally um, occasionally had to bring people in from other parts of the United States as we grow these hubs. Over time, you'll find more and more that talent remains local as we scale up the workforce. Yeah. And I would think working in a corporation is also cheaper than relocating people as well. Right, right, absolutely. Uh, okay, well, thank you. Great. Uh, appreciate the response on that. And then for those people that will be moving in, let's say when you're doing your scale up and you might have to bring people in, or will you do, will you have any types of programs or encouraging and, and not, not to the extent that you, you will require people to live in a certain area, but will you have any types of incentives to encourage people like this new, this first wave when you're building it up to encourage those, those individuals and families to, to relocate into Nashville, Metro Nashville. We've not done those programs to my knowledge in the past. We've sort of our employees live where they want to live, depending on their situation. If they have kids, school age kids, they might want to live in a particular area or whatnot. What I would say is, um, particularly with the fact that so much of our workforce is directly from the college campus, we find, you know, again, this is one of the reasons Nashville is so attractive. They want to live close to work, close to where they can go out after work with some of their coworkers and other friends in the local community to your local um, bars and restaurants and whatnot. So I would imagine a majority of our workforce would want to live close to the campus, but it's certainly not a program that we've mandated or incented our employees to do in the past. Gotcha. And just so, and just to give you give you some background on that. So, there, obviously, another piece that that we've heard, and again, this was an issue that that's just challenging with the growing city is the infrastructure from a traffic standpoint um, here in town. So, uh, the more that people can live closer, obviously, to your potential new office, if this gets approved, is better for everyone. Um, I'll tell you, I know that one of the companies that came before us. A couple of years ago, Alliance Bernstein, they've been mentioned, but I know that we asked the same question to them uh, several years ago. And, and one of the items they did is their exec, several of their executives, you know, made it an intent to move into Metro Nashville. That was a top priority for them. Um, so I would suggest, you know, certainly that would be a huge benefit in a way to encourage people living within Metro. And I know that, that that's what some of their executives did. And I think that sends a huge message that, hey, you know, we're based in Nashville, you know, we're working with the city on taxpayer dollars, and we want to, as much as we can, encourage encourage people to live within Metro Davidson County. So that that's just that's a suggestion. Uh and and I and I think they've been great, a great partner, uh, quite frankly, with our city. So uh thank you for that. And then I'll I'll come back to that, but I guess a couple more questions now, and then I, and I'm done. Uh, just related specifically more to the actual arrangement, uh, and this might be something for someone in construction or maybe Jim Murphy at Bradley. So one of the questions I was kind of asking earlier is: as we look at this incentive, we throw out this 175 million dollar number, which is a huge number, but obviously a, a, a substantial portion of this infrastructure. Uh, would have to be done by Metro anyway if the site would were to be developed. Uh, so Jim, I don't know if it's Jim or someone with Oracle. Is is Jim? Is it roughly if we were just ballparking it, a hundred million dollars of of this 175 would have to be done by Metro anyway, uh, just as public infrastructure for the area if it were to be developed. I would say that would be at least that much, Nigel. And and the reason I say that is there's some there's some provision there's some money in here for the possibility of an additional park on the site depending on the UDO amendment. We don't know whether that's going to be uh, where that's going to be, whether parks are going to want it, how big it's going to be, those how much it's going to cost. We've got some dollars in there to take that into account. And then there's also because we've not really gone far down our planning process. We've not really fleshed out all the, the numbers for all the infrastructure. 
but yes, I would think. I mean, the the, the key points of it would would get you to that number pretty easily. The critical components of the infrastructure would get you to a hundred pretty quick. Great, and I, I just think I, the reason I just want to ask that, and just and with that point too, this one hundred and seventy five million is not does not cover any costs for Oracle to actually build like the actual construction of the actual buildings. Correct. This is infrastructure. I just want to make that clear. Zero dollars. Zero dollars are going to go to the buildings from the one seventy five. Right. Yeah. The, okay. The, 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 I just think that's it. important. Thank you. I just think it's important for to understand that if folks are thinking that that the city is is paying for Oracle's buildings and, and construction, that's not the case. This is infrastructure. So thank you both for that. And and Jim, and I guess you or someone with Oracle. So obviously the deal is capped at 175 million. So if the cost is less than Oracle, let's say it's 150 million, then Metro will pay back or will pay Oracle 150 million. In the event, because it sounds like there's still a lot of due diligence and still items that need to be done. In the event that the cost exceed 175 million, and let's say it's 200 or 250 million, unless a new deal is is agreed to and amended by all parties, including Metro and Oracle, the deal is capped at 175 million. Is that am I understanding that correctly? Correct. Yes. Okay. And then this may be a question for Metro, and I have one more question. Uh, this, because of the structure of this this deal, it does not fall under the do better bill. Is that correct? That is correct. My understanding, uh, and uh, I, I should recognize the role of then Council Member Anthony Davis in formulating that. Mm -hmm. But Metro does have an, an incentive program whereby essentially for every uh, full-time position that materializes by virtue of your company relocating to Nashville, you receive an incentive of $500 per employee. This is not that at all. Um, and so the, the do better provisions which surround that um, generally do not apply. Okay, thank you. And then lastly, and then I just have, I have a couple quick comments and I'll, I'll be done. So I, I thank my fellow board members and everybody. <laughs> So, and I just want to make sure I'm, I'm clear because one of the questions that has come before me and speaking with a lot of people is why not, why not, why not push this, why not push this meeting off and, and make a decision later? And I just want to clarify. So this is what I do every day, all day, every day, except today, but uh, it is working corporate real estate in. And so... Uh, if I'm understanding you correctly, I, I just want to want to make sure because this is what I deal with. You you have the properties under contract. You've gone through your inspection period. Uh, I would uh, I would venture to say you've spent a substantial amount of money. Um, I know just on maybe Tom Trent and uh, Jim Murphy being on the call today since ten o'clock. Uh, but between you know your Sure, <laughs> but uh, certainly, but between you know legal fees, uh, costs associated with survey, title, environmental studies, geotech with the borings that was discussed earlier, I'm sure your company's already su invested a substantial amount of money. In my role, I'm typically doing deals for two to five acres, and this is a 70 acre track that you have under contract. So I can only imagine what those soft costs are right now, and you're with multiple sellers, correct? And so you're at the point where you've got to make a decision here coming up with your inspection period um, or because you don't have any more time. You've got to make a decision on whether whether to move forward or not. And it sounds like your company is not going to move forward on, into a closing period without having this or having some confidence that this is going to be the incentive deal that that you or company will be able to get that. Is that is that accurate? Am I kind of summing that up correctly? Yeah, I think I think it is uh, accurate, Mr. Hodge. I mean, I think you know any ultimate decision would would we have to talk to to Saffer and others. But obviously, we want you know as you know in deals, you want certainty of understanding what you're getting yourself into, you know, before we're going to spend hundreds of millions of dollars to buy the property. And so that's that's part of it. That's you know a big part of it. And I'll just and I'll just echo just for my fellow board members uh, that part of this I understand and 
and typically in my deals, they're not hundreds of millions of dollars because we're buying, you know, much less property. Uh, but we we act that we we proceed in the same exact manner. Um, and and you've got to get that confidence before you move into your closing period. So uh, I just think that's important to understand for and people can vote however they want. But I just I just think that's important to understand why the timing um, is critical. And it's not just some random. We just need to get this done for for a random reason there's there's actually a reason for that so all right well that's all my questions here's a couple quick comments from for me the fun and i and i just want to share this with everyone the function of the industrial development board is to acquire own lease and dispose of properties to the end that corporations may be able to promote industry and develop trade by inducing manufacturing industrial and commercial enterprises to locate in Nashville. And so with that function, the question is, at, at least for me, is does, does this economic incentive fit the function and the role of, of our board? That that's, that's how I will decide how we proceed, at least personally on my end. Couple other quick pointers, or, or points rather. It's my understanding that these that the that the property in question is currently generating about nine hundred thousand in property taxes and property tax revenue, nine hundred thousand a year. Uh, wow. And what we're talking about is additional revenue. We're talking about going from roughly nine hundred thousand to close to twenty million dollars a year based on current estimates in property tax revenue. That's what we're talking about here. That's what we need to look at. And as we consider how to move forward with this deal, uh, the current property is obviously not being maximized. And so if we want more money, and I'm a huge public school proponent, if we want more money for affordable housing and for schools, would you rather have $20 million going towards that a year uh, or, or a property generating 900,000? Uh, also, I would say in working in corporate real estate, if one good thing about this entire area is that it's a master plan development. That's positive. Um, if Oracle or were to back out of this deal, and at some point this property we would be developed, it would likely be piecemealed by various owners with necessary with not necessarily having a common or coherent strategy and plan for the entire community. So that's the other positive of having one individual developer put this together. When it comes to the HBCUs and partnering with education, uh, we've heard from our public schools director about how excited, um, about how su her support and the excitement of a company like Oracle to partner with our schools. I grew up in public schools. Um, that's one thing that will get me fired up is, is you get me started on public schools. I believe in it. It's, it's huge. I also went to, H to an HBCU, so I have a unique perspective on this. I went to Florida a and m University. You've probably seen our Marching 100 band on TV. Uh, I was not in the band, but I, I will talk about the band. Uh, and so I'll say all that to say that when you talk about a company that's willing to partner and do that, that's very exciting. I will say that in this article from the Tennessean uh, last week that had your numbers on diversity, uh, you know, those certainly need to improve, but I'll tell you the way to do it is, is if, if this is approved here in a couple of years, if you partner with our great institutions like Tennessee State University, Fisk University, where my parents attended, if you partner with the high schools and the middle schools, elementary schools in the Stratford cluster, uh, you, you should, you sh if you do that the right way, your diversity numbers uh, should improve. Lastly, and then I'm done, I, I thank everyone. When it comes to affordable housing, it's important and it matters. It's, an, it, it's something that's challenging for a growing city. I, I, would, I, would, I would say this about that aspect. Our mayor, in, in, public, in, in public articles and during our, our call today, has said that he will devote funds and his administration will devote funds from this additional revenue that's generated to affordable housing. That has nothing to do with Oracle. That is separate. Once Metro gets the revenue, it's up to Metro to devote those funds to affordable housing. And I would say this to, to all of my fellow board members and those still on the call. If you feel affordable housing is, is if you're, if you feel strongly about the issue, 
then hold our leaders accountable. And that's including the mayor's office and your council members to make sure that they do, that they say what they're going to do and devote those funds. And it's very, and, and if they do not, hey, there's a thing called a vote in elections. And if we feel that our leaders are not holding up their end of the bargain when it comes to affordable housing, then you have a vote and you can make those changes. So I just think that's something that we should not put on companies to to solve. And we need to hold our leaders accountable with, with the additional revenue to devote the funds where they say they will. Uh, Chair Hauser and fellow board members, I thank you for for the time and I'll, I'll uh, I will stop right there, so thank you. Thank you. Well, if members, uh, this is a record. This is our longest meeting we've had, but it's also our biggest deal. So, and as the commissioner has, has said publicly, this is really the biggest deal for the state. Um, so I appreciate all your patience. Um, and I think there are opportunities for this company to engage at all levels of education to create a talent pipeline. Hey, Ginger. Yes. Um, I just have a comment and, and I just want to make note that um, we are a minority majority um, county in the year 2040 with Hispanics being 34%. I mean, we talk a lot about our African Americans, but just make note that we have a large Egyptian, Kurdish, Hispanic community growing. Um, but with that, I would like to make a motion to move for approval. I, um, I think we've got some great information and I think we're ready to vote. Thank you. Okay, I second that motion. Thank you. So here's the state of play, ladies and gentlemen. Um, there has been a motion to approve the resolution regarding the economic development uh, impact plan for the River North infrastructure. It has been seconded by Quinn Siegel. Um, are there any questions related to the motion itself? Sure, sure. Sure. The only question I have is maybe for Margaret or sorry. Okay. I think parliamentary procedure is the question relates to the motion itself. If I'm correct. Oh, sorry. Was your question related to the motion? No. Okay. So I think with that, um, we are ready to vote. Again, we will go down the roll. And um, and then, Nigel, maybe we can get to your sort of procedural question, sort of wrap up uh, after that. What are our next steps? Okay. So, again, we are just approving this impact plan so that it can move forward to the council and be shared with the mayor. This is, has nothing to do with the rezoning, uh, the park board, all that other process. This is just the impact plan. So we'll now take a roll call vote. Uh, Chair Ginger, if I could just interrupt really quick. The, yeah. the resolution approves the impact plan and, and the project agreement. And, uh, and I just wanted to make that clear that both of those items are approved in the in the resolution that's, that's uh, under the subject of the motion. Thank you for that clarification. And maybe Nigel, that's what you were going to ask. So sorry. <laughs> OK, with that. We're ready to have a roll call vote. Uh, Nigel Hodge. Uh, in favor of support. Thank you, Ken Weaver. Aye. Can you say it again? Aye, I approve. Thank you. Thank you. Christina Allen. Approved. Quinn Siegel. Aye. Tequila Johnson. No. Sarah Hanna. Aye. Winnie Forrester. I vote against it. Okay. And me as a chair, I vote aye. So we have approved. So this will now go to the council. Chair, um, you forgot. Yeah. Chair, this is Marty for Anthony Davis. Oh my gosh, Anthony. I'm looking, <laughs> I'm looking here and it's been, it's been four and a half hours. Thank you, Margaret. Anthony, Anthony, you're still outside. Where are you on this? I'm voting yes to send this to council. Thank you. Obviously, I'm fading just a bit. So um, we have approved this resolution. 
I really think it's been a wonderful discussion today, a wonderful discussion with the company, with the state, with our city leaders, and, and with our citizenry. So this, this process is just beginning, and uh, we will have other opportunities when uh, the state package comes to us and through the Metro Council. And I really encourage all of the folks that called in, or if you didn't have the opportunity to call in, stay engaged in this process. There are lots of opportunities here to make sure that Oracle is gonna be the shining star that we want it to be as we move forward together. Mr. Helter, if I could just say on behalf of Oracle, thank you so much for your vote of confidence and for the past four and a half hours you've dedicated to us in this project. We do greatly appreciate it. The discussion today has been amazing. We've listened and we've heard you, whether it be from the public that called in or from the great questions that the council had, that the board had today. We appreciate the time and we look forward to working with you all as we continue to move through this exciting process. So thank you so much. Thank you, and we look forward to uh, seeing you all in person after we're all vaccinated and, and then may the mayor and the governor are allowing us to do that, so thank you. Absolutely, we look forward to that as well. All right, thank so um, set me straight on our next item on the agenda, Margaret. Am I at B, which is considered the approval of the, the state economic and community development um, fast track grant for Revenants Therapeutics? Is that where we are? That's correct. It's, uh, I believe it's Revance Therapeutics. Thank you for the correction on the pronunciation, Revance. And I believe Sarah Fahey has remained on this call to uh, present. Sarah, tell us what we have before us and tell us a little bit about this company since obviously I didn't even get the pronunciation correct. That's okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for your patience. It's been fascinating to listen to all of the public comment and uh, just learn more about the passionate residents in town. Uh, we are Revance Therapeutics. We, um, we have just relocated our corporate offices to Nashville, Tennessee, as of the first of the year, originally a California-based entity that had our that is keeping our three offices in Southern California and Northern California. We are a biotech company that is developing innovative aesthetics and therapeutic uh, treatments. And we're very excited to be relocating our very small compared to Oracle new <laughs> corporate headquarters uh, in, um, in Nashville. Um, and I am very excited to say that we are already down the track of hiring a number of Nashvillians. Um, uh, we've got a commitment to hire about 150 new Nashville employees over the next five years and uh, and are just really excited to be new neighbors in coming into town. And I'll keep it short and hand it over to you. Thank you. And Sarah, for those of us who are not in sort of the science world, um, can you put in layman's terms, tell us what what kind of jobs these are and uh, is it sure. vaccinations? Is it, yeah. talk to us yeah, about no. Absolutely. Um, our manufacturing plant is actually in Northern California and will stay there. The roles that are being brought to Nashville are all new roles. We've only relocated a couple of key executives. Um, so really, these are all new roles that will be hired by local Nashville talent over the next five years. I think we've already got a few dozen that have started in our temporary offices. And they are everything from human resources to financial roles to, um, to financial technology roles. So we also acquired, we're a biotech company that is producing products, but we also acquired a financial technology company called HintMD last year. And we're building out uh, a whole team of um, customer service, customer success, and financial technology professionals as well. So kind of everything from GNA functions, management functions, to financial technology located at our training and education center. And also our corporate offices, there are really gonna be a training and education center where we bring in doctors and other healthcare professionals into the area to learn about our products as they become approved. Gotcha. And obviously you've heard the, the deep interest in our community yes. to, to work with our K-12 and college and university systems to kind of develop pipelines of talent and 
and hope that that is something that that you welcome engagement on. Um, it is actually to, to that point I didn't mention um, we're really excited to be putting together an internship program as well uh, that our new head of talent is a, a Nashville resident that has joined our team recently Candy Flowers and she's got a great relationship with Fisk University already and so that is definitely a, um, a kind of talent pathway that we're looking at continuing to shepherd as we build out our, our team in Nashville going forward great so who um Bob Tuke or who else on uh, that wants to describe Margaret do you want to describe the the nature of the fast track well uh I, we have I, I believe she's still on the call Lindy Baronis from I don't know if I'm pronouncing her last name correctly but from the state um, ECD office. She has um, helped to shepherd through some of these agreements and then I can explain to you what the board would be approving today Great. Yeah, Lindsay, just, thanks for uh, thanks for hanging in here with us. No, of course. It's been an exciting morning. So thank you for, for hosting and thanks to the IDB for all you do. Um, with our projects um, for the ED grants, which is the Economic Development Grant, the IDB acts as a pass-through um, for our funds. So with the ED grant, uh, the IDB or Metro is not providing any funds directly to the companies, but instead acting as the pass through of the state incentive funds from the state to um, the company specifically. So through our state statute with econo economic development grants, the state can't pay a private company directly. And so that's throughout all of the counties across Tennessee, we use the IDB as, as this entity. So we're really happy to partner um, with the IDB in the process of, of incentivizing, the state incentivizing um, our companies that are creating jobs um, through the state. So thank you very much. Let me know if you have any other specific questions. Thank you, Lindy. Margaret, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Um, certainly. Um, so I've, uh, hopefully everybody recalls um, how we do these fast track grants. Um, there is there are basically three agreements that are a part of this grant. There is an agreement between the state and the IDB um, that where the state agrees to give the money to the IDB for the purpose um, of assisting this company. Um, and then there is a what we call uh, colloquially a mirror grant between the IDB and the company where we pass where the IDB passes on its obligations to the company and agrees to pay the company the funds that we receive from the state if the company meets those um, meets those requirements. Um, and then there is a three party ag accountability agreement. And this is the component where and the three parties are the IDB, the company, and the state. And this is the agreement whereby the state, sorry, the company um, agrees to meet the, uh, the, the jobs compliance um, percentages and those amounts. And uh, just so we're clear, the funds that the state provides to the IDB have to be directly associated with construction or um, some sort of physical um, improvement at the location. And it's based on a reimbursement, right? Just to clarify. Absolutely. It's a reimbursement. It's not an upfront payment. And I believe with this company and with the next company, um, they have already started to incur costs. So uh, those, if we approve this today, then those costs going back to, um, I believe for this one, it's back to uh, November of last year would be covered. Gotcha. And the amount of this grant is um, $1,250,000. Okay. Any questions on what's before us? Do I have a motion to approve this sort of collection of three agreements? And I see Nigel with his hand up. Nigel, you're recognized. I'll make a motion to approve. Okay, do I have a second? A second. Okay, I think that was Ken. Any discussion? Yeah. Hearing no discussion, we are ready for a roll call vote. Nigel Hodge. Aye. Ken Weaver. Aye. Christina Allen. 
Aye. Quinn Siegel. Aye. Tequila Johnson. Aye. Sarah Hanna. Aye. Winnie Force. I'm sorry, will you say that again? You kind of broke up. I think that was an I. Um, and my forgotten friend, Anthony Davis. I got me this one. <laughs> I got you this time. And Ginger Hauser, I. You approve. Okay, we're, we're, we're moving forward. I don't see me. Considering the approval of a state economic development fast track grant for August bioservices. And there are three agreements, as um, Margaret described before, the same types of agreements. Um, and I believe, do we have someone from August Bioservices still on the line? Or are we going to go to Lindy? Yeah, yeah, yes, I believe Matt uh, Bjorkman. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly. Absolutely. And Matt's with an S. Yeah, yeah. Really nice. Let me see All right. Tell, tell us about your uh, tell us about your company and the agreement. And I'm guessing um, with that last name and Matt's that that you probably have an interesting cultural story. Yeah, I have definitely. I can take that another time when we have more mm -hmm. more time on the agenda. Definitely. I just wanted to introduce our CEO of the company, also Jen Adams, and uh, hand it hand it over to her to tell uh, the the story of the company and. And, and and so on where we stand and the, the background to the to the fast grant grant fast grant application that we did here in half year last year. Great, thank you. Um, so we are August Bioservices and we are already headquartered in Nashville, Tennessee. We have another location in Salina, Tennessee as well. And we are at high-tech growth-focused uh, biotechnology company, and we serve biotech and pharma uh, customers and partner with them. Um, our expertise is deep drug discovery, development, and manufacturing services. So we are a CDMO, a contract development um, manufacturing organization, and we also have a CRO, contract research organization, embedded within our company. So we provide a, a wide array of services that help uh, pharmaceutical and biotechnology companies accelerate the advancement of their novel therapeutics um, along the drug development pathway. So our goal is to take uh, these projects from the laboratory to the bedside of patients. Um, so we do discovery, we do development, um, we do manufacturing of life-saving therapeutics, and the plans that we worked uh, to represent to the state of Tennessee um, include two capital projects. So the first is a renovation of our existing facility here in Nashville. And then the second is, a, is the construction of a brand new high tech, high speed uh, pharmaceutical manufacturing facility on the land adjacent to this one, um, which is right behind this building. So the two buildings would operate as, as, as one uh, contiguous campus. And the benefit of these expansion projects are that they allow us to bring new capabilities on board that allow us to better serve more customers. So different types of filling technologies that address the needs of different types of molecules and also more capacity. So in combination, when we're finished with both of these projects, we will have essentially onboarded um, close to 50 million doses of sterile injectable medication manufacturing here in Tennessee. And then along with that, um, our hiring plan has us growing from where we are right now, which is at uh, 64 employees uh, total in our company, um, to 240. So it's the addition of 180 uh, new jobs as part of these projects and to support the work that we do here. And yeah. it, it, the roles are diverse. So there are certainly quite a few. Um, scientific, uh, you know, research type positions. Uh, there, are, there are many engineering uh, opportunities as we build our business. Um, lots of roles within quality and regulatory affairs. Um, project management is uh, a group that we plan to staff up as we grow. And then when we build our new facility, there will be manufacturing jobs and all of the supportive 
um, kind of functional roles uh, to, to, to operate that facility. Great. Remind us where you're located. We're just east of the airport on Elm Hill Pike. Okay, great. We'd love to see that in geographic diversity in the projects. Uh, Lindy, let's go to you and tell us tell us about the state fast track. I can't can hear me, Ginger. It's the same as what I just described um, previously for the other project. It's an economic development grant. Uh, IDB is just acting as a pass through for the funds from uh, the state funds from um, ECD to the company directly. As Margaret mentioned earlier, um, all of our grants are reimbursable grants for hard costs that the company pays upfront for um, new construction or um, any kind of capital expenditures, retrofit of existing buildings or new facilities. And so August um, is building a secondary facility um, on the land adjacent to their current facility facility on Elm Hill Pike, and they also uh, are doing some upgrades to existing. So we will be reimbursing them for those hard costs. Great, Margaret. Uh, and and like the uh, uh, the agreements for Revance, August Bioservices also has the three agreements: the one between the IDB and the state, the mirror agreement between the IDB and the company and also the accountability agreement. The value of this grant is $2 million and it will cover expenses going back to July 1st of last year um, through June 30th of 2023. Gotcha. Any questions um, or a motion? I'll make a motion to approve. Okay, Nigel. I'm sorry, I didn't hear who made this again. Oh, it's Quinn. I'll second. Okay, thank you, Quinn. We have a motion. We have a second. Um, any questions on the motion? We're ready for a vote. Nigel Hodge. Aye. Uh, Ken Weaver. Aye. Ken, I think you're muted, my friend. Aye, sorry. <laughs> Christine Allen. Aye. Quinn Siegel. Aye. Tequila Johnson. Aye. Sarah Hanna. Aye. Winnie Forrester. Winnie, I didn't hear you. Sorry. Anthony Davis. Aye. And I vote aye. So you have approved. And we have a fast track grant by Warby for Warby Parker that is before us. This is item D. And we still have somebody on from Warby Parker. We do. Um, and this is this is Margaret speaking. We do, um, before we get started, if I could just tell you what this is, it's a little bit different than the last ones. This is an amendment to their accountability agreement to which we are a party, um, to which the IDB is a party. And it will, from my understanding, extend the accountability agreement for one year. It doesn't extend the grant term for when they have to have made um, their improvements for the property, but the accountability agreement will be extended for one year because of the pandemic. I believe the state has given this opportunity to all of their grantees. The, remember, the accountability agreement is the, the document that um, tells the company what their employee uh, compliance rate is supposed to be in order to maintain that grant amount. So they will have another year to make sure they have their employee numbers um, to where they need to be. Um, I hope Lindy will step in if I have totally butchered that explanation. No, that's okay. absolutely 
that's absolutely correct, Margaret. <laughs> um, the IDB will probably most likely be seeing quite a few of these come through over um, the next several months through the IDB for approval. Um, we did extend it to all of our companies that currently have open active grants with the state due to the pandemic. We offered all of our projects currently under an accountability agreement with us, an extension of one year because the legal force majeure clause or act of God does not cover a pandemic. Uh, we wanted our businesses to have an additional year added. Um, so we have other companies taking us up on this. So you'll, you'll see probably several more of these as the months go by. Thanks for the heads up and, and good that the state is flexible. Obviously it's been a difficult year for all employers. Um, and um, Dawn Wong is on the call from Warby Parker. Dawn, Hi, thank you for your incredible patience. No problem. Um, hi, my name is Dawn. Um, I'm the senior tax analyst at Warby's tax department, and I've been working with the company for a year and a half. Uh, I work with my tax director, Axel, for state and federal tax compliance, but he's unable to join because he's traveling, so I'll be representing Warby today. Um, so a little bit of, about our company. Uh, Warby Parker is a retailer of prescription glasses and sunglasses. We're based in New York City, and we primarily sell products through our website, but we also have retail locations across the U.S. and Canada. As of April 30th of this year, we will have 137 stores across the U.S. and Canada, and we aim to add around 30 to 40 new stores every single year. So a little bit about our activities in Nashville. So our customer experience team is headquartered in Nashville at the LNC Tower located at 401 Church Street, and this... Gone, we just lost it. Dawn, I'm showing that you're muted. Hi, sorry, I think I dropped on the phone. Can you still hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so this serves as an operations hub for our team members who help our customers place orders, manage prescription review, and ensure a smooth shopping experience with Warby Parker. Since our activities in, since our, uh, the beginning of our activities in Nashville, we have spent a total of 6.3 million in capital expenditures in Tennessee, and 4.5 million of that is related to our customer experience team in Nashville. We have created 223 new net jobs through September 2020, which represents an 84% fulfillment of our obligations to create 263 new net jobs. We only count full-time employees with health benefits towards this obligation. We're requesting an amendment to our accountability agreement because we've slowed down hiring in 2020 due to COVID-19, and we're only able to add three new net jobs that year. This amendment will provide additional time for us to fulfill our obligations, given that the COVID-19 situation is still fluid and evolving and plans to return to the office are still being developed. For 2021, we are planning to add 11,000 square feet to our office space in LNC Tower with 90 additional desks, inclusive of a new large conference space. We hope to add 100 new team members in the Nashville area to support continued demand for online sales, but we recognize that concrete plans for 2021 are held to develop in light of the current situation with COVID. Um, thank you for hearing our amendment request today. I'm happy to provide any further information if needed. And please hold because I don't think I could hear any of you from my computer, so I will have to dial in again. <laughs> gotcha. Thank you, Dawn. Um, I think it's pretty self-explanatory what is before us. Or, are there any questions about the one-year extension? I will entertain a motion. So moved. It has been moved. Do I have a second? Again. Okay. Welcome to WebEx. <laughs> Thank you. It, uh, we have a second. All right. We are now ready to vote. Nigel Hodge. I, I, I'm going to abstain. I, I have some computer issues, so I missed some of that discussion, so I'll abstain on this one. Okay. Ken Weaver. Sorry. Thank you. I and I'm not going to recuse myself, even though I have Warby Parker glasses. <laughs> I was there a week ago trying on frames myself. Um, Christina Allen, are you still with us? I know she had to drop off for a three o'clock meeting. She may be gone. 
Okay, Wayne Siegel. Aye. Tequila Johnson. Aye. Sarah Hanna. I didn't hear Sarah. Sarah. I believe Sarah had to drop off also for calls this afternoon. So I'm hoping Winnie, we still Winnie have a Forrester. Camera. Winnie Forrester. Mm. Winnie, can you say it again? Is that a yes? Really okay. good. Approved. Okay, thank you. Anthony Davis. Aye. And Ginger Hauser, aye. You approve. In the, in the um, interest of time, we were going to um, discuss the new director of economic development for the city. Obviously, uh, he's going to we're going to we're going to if there are no objections we're going to put him on the agenda for our next meeting so we can get to know him a little bit better um i believe margaret you are going to give us our financial uh business is that correct yes um so before we move on to that there were some old business items that got moved to the heel of the agenda yes so technically those were under I think item 4A and 4B. Okay, so item 4A, Hannah Davis asked if she could come to next meeting instead of this one. Um, and probably given that it's 305, that was uh, fortuitous on her part. So we'll bring her back. Um, the reason to remind you we wanted her before us is to give us the recommendations of the Affordable Housing Task Force. I know this board has cared about it. It's come up today. And then really also begin to explore how can the IDB be in a, a, a help and assistant um, to working on these sorts of issues. So that will come to us next month. Um, and then there is another item. We have had some TEFRA required hearings the last few months. And this is a requirement um, on certain types of deals. And our attorney, Margaret, has recommended that we consider allowing our outside counsel, Bob Took, to be the board's designee for one year to hold these TEFRA hearings. And Margaret, maybe I'll just um, recognize you to explain that um, and explain what the TEFRA hearing is to remind us. So federal law requires that uh, any sort of um, private activity bond, which is what you issue when you issue bonds uh, for for, bond, for conduit borrowers for businesses, um, to go before a public hearing, and that public hear the the federal law is kind of silent on how the process and procedure for that hearing is to take place. But the, um, there are some regulations which explore how uh, permissive it is to, uh, to hold those hearings outside of your normal course of business. So it, the, the guidance under the regulations does allow for the board to designate a person um, or other entity of, uh, to hold the hearings um, outside of the normal course of business. And that's what I'm recommending here. We're about to, and I was gonna probably get to this at another point, but we're, we're reaching the point right now where the governor's order for uh, remote hearings is, I'm sorry, remote meetings is going to expire. So moving forward into May, we should be getting back into in-person meetings. Uh, we might still have to meet some social distancing requirements for us and for visitors, and we'll figure out those logistics offline at some point. But if we're going to go back to the in-person meetings, it could be helpful for us to have the, the required public hearing um, outside of the scope of a regular meeting because no action has to be taken on behalf for that public hearing, so there doesn't need to be a quorum. This doesn't mean that board members are excluded from that. Any board member can show up for that public hearing if they want to attend. And I just want to make sure that you understand that if you adopt this resolution, that the public hearing 
that would be subject to it is only the TEFRA hearing that's required under 147 sub F, not uh, the type of hearing that we just had today. The type of hearing that we were required to have for the EIP would still go forward before the board. It would not be, um, we would not be delegating that to, uh, to, to Bob or to our issuers council. Thank you. So here's, here's where I sort of am, and I, I want some feedback from the board. If we feel like we need discussion around this, I'm sort of feeling that we move this to next meeting to where we have a, a little more brain power and energy to sort of think through it. If folks right now are fine with moving in this direction, then, then I will defer to the will of the board. So um, thoughts, board members? My, my chair, my recommendation is to just move to the next meeting. Uh, you know, I'll defer to the other board members, but I like that suggestion just based on us having such an in-depth meeting today that was very engaging as well. Okay. Well, I, would, if I, I was just going to say I'd agree. I think we've lost a lot of members too. Okay. So. All right. Let's move I'm back. Out of brain power. I, oh, yeah, okay. I, I think I'm out, out of brain power too. So let, since, since this is not necessarily time sensitive, let's move this to the next meeting, um, which is likely to be in person. Um, so I look forward to seeing all of you. Um, John, I'm so disappointed. I wanted to have two and a half hours with people calling in. Is it, is it because you're charging us by the hour, Bob? Is that what you're talking no. about? I'm so happy you're going to push it back. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Bob so, has a tea time. He's got a tea time. That's what's really going on. There you go. <laughs> so I, I want to thank, you know, as we move on to the financial matters, I want to thank Margaret Walker and Ajoy for sort of just working the phones and that whole process. I know that had to be incredibly difficult. Um, and that was sort of the folks you didn't see that made that public hearing and phone call work today. So I just want to thank them publicly for their work. And um, we are ready, I believe, for item six, which is financial matters. Um, so, uh, Margaret Walker, since she was doing the phones today, asked me to, to do the financial matter presentation, and she has let me know that as of April 26, 20, 2021, the board has in their account $68,467.16, and, $68, and I don't believe there have been any expenses since the last meeting. Okay, so my suggestion is going to be to, we've got to look at space and where we're going to have it and all of those sort of logistical things with this order to determine the location and time and day of the next meeting. So I think we can probably coordinate that through email and then obviously that will be public noticed as well. Um, and just as a reminder, I'm sure when we're meeting in person, we're going to be socially distanced and we'll be wearing masks. So yeah. everybody so, stay safe, drink some water, eat some food, um, take care of yourself today. This has been some important work, probably maybe some of the most important work this board has ever done. So I, I am grateful for your free donation of service um that hopefully we'll look back at these projects and we'll be able to see that we've changed Nashville for the better so with that there being no other business before us I will entertain a motion to adjourn so Ginger before we motion to adjourn I got one thing to say oh okay hold on personal privilege Ken I, I don't know what it is but you know I just wanted to thank Margaret for the hey, job yeah. she has done um over the past few months when, you know, she was the last person standing. We just really appreciate it. So now you can do your motion to uh, adjourn. Well, no, Ken, that was that was a point well made. Uh, I'm sure when Margaret took a job with Metro Legal, right. she didn't think she was gonna be running the IDB on the back end and she just stepped <laughs> in and has done it like a champ. So we appreciate her work. And I also want to add my appreciation because there's no way in the world I could have done what she did. It's her knowledge, it's her relationships, it's her dependability, 
Um, I just can't tell you enough. You know, it, 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 sometimes sometimes we're really happy with lawyers that we work with, uh, if you're a lawyer already, and sometimes not. And Margaret has been a gift. Agreed. Y'all are too kind, and I love working with all of you. <laughs> when you're having a bad day, you can replay that. How about it? <laughs> okay, with that, um, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion. All right, we don't need to vote on this, I am told. So we are adjourned, and thank you for being part of the record-breaking meeting of the Industrial Development Board of Metro and National Development Academy. Yay. Good rest of your day. Bye. Take care. Take care, Take care everybody. Bye bye. Vaccinated. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit Nashville.gov.